Good morning. Will sergeants please start their recordings? Computer recording rolling. According to the cloud, all set. Backup is rolling. Thank you. And Sergeant Biondo, with your opening statement. Yes. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Committees on Public Housing, jointly with the Committee on Aging. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruptions, we ask you to please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you'd like to submit testimony, please send via email to testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation, Chairs Amphrey Samuel and Chair Chin. We are ready to begin. Thank you and good morning. The hearing is coming to order. Good morning and thank you for coming to today's joint hearing by the Committee on Public Housing and the Committee on Aging. I am Council Member Alika Amprey Samuel and I chair the Public Housing Committee. And thank you to my co-chair, Council Member Chair Margaret Chen for making this joint hearing possible on the seniors aging in place in NYCHA during the pandemic. We are also joined today by committee members, council member Reverend Diaz Sr., council member Traga, council member Menchaca, council member Riley, council member Van Bramer, council member Salamanca, and council member Jonai. And we are also joined by council members Brooks Powers and council member Deutsch. Today, we will have the opportunity to discuss an important group within the NYCHA community, our seniors. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken a disproportionate toll on NYCHA residents and seniors. Together, that creates a special vulnerability among our seniors that live in NYCHA. We are here today because we want to know what the city is doing to provide NYCHA seniors with resources and services they need and deserve to ensure their health, safety, and well being. The height of the pandemic brought darkness and death that we have never seen in our lifetimes. We as a city, got a lot of things wrong. And from those lessons, we have no excuses to not get it all right, right now. I represent the many seniors who live in my district with pride. Whether they live in public housing, private housing, senior only housing that's not on NYCHA grounds, my seniors are vocal, they are engaged, and they like to follow the rules. In fact, some of the rules led to severe isolation, which is where we still feel and are feeling the effects today. I've heard from many of the seniors in NYCHA buildings in my district about the challenges that they have faced during the pandemic. But I also want to be clear that the burdens NYCHA seniors have shouldered throughout the pandemic are not limited to the ones in my district or to any one district alone. Our two committees last, the, our two committees held a joint hearing on this topic in December of 2018. And at that time, it was unclear exactly how NYCHA and DIFTA were coordinating their efforts to meet the unique needs of seniors in NYCHA developments. And frankly, we were not able to get much clarity then. So now two years later, we remain committed to getting answers and pushing both NYCHA and DIFTA to be more transparent and collaborative, working together about how they are serving NYCHA's older population. We are especially interested in hearing about these efforts given the new challenges that COVID-19 pandemic has presented. Because of the disproportionate effect of the virus on older adults, many have had to shelter at home for the last year. 
Many have had poor or no internet access, limiting their ability to stay connected with family and loved ones. And many have had limited access to food, supplies, and even essential services like heat and hot water. Additionally, we are looking for updates on some of the issues that came up at the 2018 hearing. We wanna know what's going on with our senior centers, including update plans to expand them to senior buildings and developments that still don't have them, or even have standalone centers recognized that are currently operating without contracts and funding. We wanna know whether critical repairs have been made while the centers have been closed during the pandemic. We will also be hearing two pieces of legislation that I believe will go a long way in improving services for NYCHA, for seniors in NYCHA. Intro, intro number 415, sponsored by Council Member Chin, will require NYCHA to annually report on senior centers. I understand this bill was originally drafted before DIFTA took over the operation of all senior centers. So with the caveat that the bill would need to be amended so that the right entity is doing the reporting, we expect to hear testimony on the merits of the bill. And my bill, intro number 1827, would establish a liaison to NYCHA within DIFTA. And this would be an important common sense step in improving the coordination of services between NYCHA and DIFTA. The liaison would be responsible for, among other things, more clearly delineating roles and responsibilities between NYCHA and DIFTA. For creating a system for senior residents to submit comments and complaints about programs and facilities, and to simply be able to identify who and where our seniors are. So before I close, I wanna thank committee staff, Audrey Sun, Jose Condi, Sarah Gaslam, Ricky, and Ricky Chala, along with my council staff, Everton, Naomi, and Jennifer for all of your hard work to make this hearing happen. And with that, I will now turn it over to my co-chair, council member chair, Margaret Chin for her opening remarks. Good morning. I'm Council Member Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging, and I would like to welcome you to today's joint hearing um, on seniors aging in place in NYCHA during a pandemic. I'd like to thank Chair Emperor Samuels for co-chairing this very important hearing with me. During today's hearing, we will be discussing what has been done to keep our seniors city's NYCHA seniors safe and healthy during the COVID-19 pandemic. We expect both DIFTA and NYCHA to testify as to the efforts they have undertaken to reach NYCHA seniors during the pandemic and offer them critical services, including a safe place to live. We will also be hearing testimony on two pieces of legislation. My co-chair has already spoken about the first one, intro 1827, which she is sponsoring. The second piece of legislation, intro 415, is sponsored by myself. This important legislation would allow us to get more information about NYCHA, about senior centers within their buildings. Intro 415 requires the agency to report a NYCHA senior center including such information as complaint file with NYCHA and what NYCHA has done to address these issues. This bill seeks to ensure transparency and accountability surrounding our NYCHA Senior Center. And I look forward to hearing testimony on how to strengthen it. As many of you remember, back in 2018, the Committee on Aging and Public Housing came together for a joint hearing on senior services and centers in NYCHA. It was at the hearing that we learned about some of the troubling realities of our seniors in NYCHA. We learned, for example, that some NYCHA seniors have been living in high-rise buildings where elevators have been broken for months. Some of these buildings have also had mold, ceilings that are falling in, peeling paint, heavy leaks, and rodents. We learned that these terrible conditions were also prevalent in NYCHA senior centers and social clubs. At times, many of these facilities 
have also lacked proper heat in the winter and proper airflow in the summer. At the hearing, our seniors and advocates came forward and spoke the truth. They demand the change. And I want, to know, I want you to know that the council is standing with you all in this fight, just as we did three years ago. It is now April, 2021. We are living in a pandemic that has only exasperated the problem raised in 2018. While life we know has changed for everyone in New York City, NYCHA seniors have been hit particularly hard by the virus. In October, 2020, for example, it was reported the senior in NYCHA buildings with poor ventilation were being slammed by COVID-19. At the time, the infection rate in 22 NYCHA senior development were much higher than, uh, than the rate for the rest of the city. For example, a NYCHA development of Bronx occupied mostly by senior reported a 9% infection rate. A senior only development in Upper Manhattan reported 8% and a senior only the housing development in Brooklyn showed a rate of 5%. All of these rates were significantly higher than the city's average infection rate at the time of only 2.9%. This disproportionate impact on our senior, on our NYCHA senior is extremely concerning. This is why I was pleased to learn about the city's effort to get seniors living in NYCHA vaccinated. These efforts have included opening vaccination center in NYCHA and conducting outreach to NYCHA, NYCHA residents to answer questions and help them sign up for vaccine appointment. However, although I'm happy to hear about these efforts, I am even more concerned about the results. How many seniors in NYCHA have been reached by these efforts? And how many seniors have been vaccinated? How have NYCHA and DIFTA been working to make sure our homebound seniors are being vaccinated? How will both agencies make sure the vaccination rate among NYCHA residents and especially NYCHA senior matches the vaccination rate across all neighborhood in the city? Additionally, what steps are the administration taking to address long-standing NYCHA issue like elevator breakdowns that may be preventing seniors from going out to receive their vaccinations. With so many stay-at-home orders being enacted in the past year, what work has NYCHA been doing to ensure that senior residents have a safe and sanitary home to socially distant in? Before the pandemic, our seniors were forced to live in apartments with rodent, mold, and falling ceilings. That was unacceptable even then. And we must know that NYCHA is doing all that it can to ensure our seniors are not living in these conditions while they have nowhere else to go. Finally, while I know we've been focusing our efforts on protecting our seniors from the coronavirus, I want to stress that it is equally important that we protect their mental health and social well being. So many of our seniors, so many of our seniors have been isolated at home for over a year, and we are eager to safely interact with their neighbors and friends again. I have said this many, many times before, and will keep saying it until it happens. We need to safely reopen our senior centers. I am looking forward to hearing about the administration's plan to do such that. I'd like to thank the committee staff for their help in putting together this hearing. Our council, Musa Chidori, policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, finance analyst, Daniel Krupp, and finance unit head, Johini Sapora. i also like to thank my director of legislation communication, Connor Urban. I'd like to thank the other members of the committee who have joined us today. Now I will turn it back to Chair Abril Samuel. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Chen. 
We have also been joined by Majority Leader Cumbo, Council Member Adams, and Council Member Eugene. Before we proceed to opening panels of our NYCHA residents, I will briefly turn it over to our committee council, Audrey Sun, to go over some procedural items. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Audrey Sun, counsel to the city council's committee on public housing. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. When it is your turn, I will call your name and you will be unmuted. We will now hear from an opening panel of uh, NYCHA residents, followed by council member questions, if any. In order to hear from everyone, the clock, clock will be set to three minutes. Uh, we will now hear from John Derek Norvell. I'm starts now. Yes, hello. It's John Derek Novell. Can you hear me? No? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, um, <clears throat> I'm a resident of Abraham Lincoln Houses, and I am I just turned 67 about two weeks ago, um, March, uh, March 18th. And um, I, um, I am concerned, uh, I've been a, an advocate for public housing for quite some time. I, uh, was a lobby in DC with the New York, uh, the, the, the National Low Income Housing Coalition. I was also guarding at Lightham in the courts for seniors uh, until, uh, and then I also worked for the um, Division of Human Rights before my untimely accident, a hit and run victim I was <clears throat> uh, in January, 2011 but I still am an activist for these issues. And <clears throat> I am concerned about, as I told Ms. Son yesterday, the problem that we have with our water being cut off or virtually cut off in the uh, bathrooms. I mean, it's down to a trickle when it's the, uh, the bathroom sink with the uh, hot water. And this happened uh, about two years, I think before the pandemic, it was part of, um, and I think the term they use was aeration, you know, these new terms, when, what did that mean? And um, what happened was they cut down the level of our water in the bathroom sink. And so um, with these issues of washing your hands and all of this, um, you know, we just have a, a, you know, just a small stream coming from the hot water. And, that, and then we have to wait till the hot water warms up. Last week, there was a problem with the water and we didn't have any water at all in the um, sinks. And um, when we did, it was cold for, for a long while and then finally it heated up. But <clears throat> without having the hot water that we used to have and the cold water, I mean, you wonder how can you, you know, I mean, we do our best. We do our best under this virus and that to keep, uh, you know, the wash, the hand washing and everything else. I wear two face masks, I wear a face shield and everything else. I'm very serious about this virus. But these things are done, the cutting down of our water without consulting us, without asking our opinion or anything. The same thing happened before when we used to have the trash compactors and the burning of our garbage. It was, you know, all that was stopped without consulting us. And then we had uh, a rise in rodents and we still have a problem with rodents and stuff. And we have to wait and wait and wait till we have an, an exterminator come by and take care of that issue and that, you know, and um, they were pretty good exterminator here, but just, um, the, the services are very slow, again, because of the pandemic. But what really concerns me is the water and the water issues and that. And we want our water back like it was. I mean, I don't know why our water was cut the way it was in the, you know, in the bathroom sink and, and such and that. And we want both uh, the hot water and the cold water. And oh, <clears throat> this winter has been the worst. Every time it's been cold, and it's been pretty cold this winter, we have had virtually no heat, very, very little heat at all. Time expired. When it's warm, we get all the heat in the world, which is just as bad. We want heat when it's seven degrees, not when it's heat when it's 65. And those are some of the issues that we have. Thanks very much. If there aren't any questions from either chair or council members, we will now turn to testimony from the administration. I do have a, oh, I do have a question from Mr. Norvell. Is this 
current is, is there a current problem right now with the water pressure? Mr. Norvell? I believe he's currently at he's currently muted. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, well, as I was saying, we still have that problem. I don't know if it's administrative or what, with the hot water in the bathroom sink, where it's just a small stream. It's just, you know, it's water, but it's a small stream. And, uh, <clears throat> and then when you turn on the cold water, something like that, nothing happens. I mean, it's just a small stream coming out of um, uh, the, the faucet when you turn the hot water on. And I mean, you have to, you know, you have to wait for it to warm up. And then you really, I mean, you have to wash for a <laughs> while. Oh, oh, you know, more than usual, just to make sure that your hands are clean. And we, you know, we keep hand sanitizer as well as soap and that. But I just would like to know why was our water cut down without even consulting us or, or even asking us? You know, I, that's, um, I'm still bothered by that. Okay, thank you. Oh. Yeah, I have a question uh, for Mr. Lovell. Yes. Do you have an active resident association in your development? Uh, yes, we do. <clears throat> they're in um, they're in an um, an apartment building now. Uh, uh, you know, on the first floor, uh, and of course, because of the virus, that we you know we don't uh, have the uh, the use of the um, of the um, of the senior center. But we have another issue with the senior center. We used to be able to vote in the senior center and that too was taken away from us. And so we have to travel about two blocks down to a school in order to vote. And I can tell you the first time that we were there, it was not prepared for us. There were nails sticking up out of the floor. Many of our seniors have uh, wheelchairs and rollators. I have a rollator. And we were saying, we went and we said, this place is not even ready for us to vote. This was about, uh, Maybe about maybe about three or four years ago, and and um, we still um, we we still have to vote at the school we we uh, which is about three blocks down from us. We uh, we we lost the the voting uh, uh, polling places in our senior center, and I'm angry about that as well. Well, we're gonna have um, committee council or our staff follow up with you uh, mm -hmm. to get to the bottom of this. I mean, this is unacceptable that you're not getting information about why um, the water service is so, um, it's, it's a problem. And yes. they should really tell you when it's gonna be fixed. Well, and, not having, and not having heat, that's, that's unacceptable. Oh, that was, that was um, very rough, extremely rough this year. Extremely yeah. rough. Yeah. So we will follow up with you uh, to get more detail. And, uh, and I hope that the NYCHA representative uh, who are at this hearing today will also follow up with you and your development. Because what you're telling us is really unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. If there are no further questions, we will now turn to testimony from the administration. A reminder to council members to please use the Zoom raise hand function if you would like to ask the administration any questions. Uh, in the interest of time, you will be set to a clock of five minutes. After we hear from the administration, we will hear from the remaining members of the public. I will now administer the oath to the administration, which is represented by Sadia Sherman and Yuka Buskit from NYCHA and Merlene Shallow, Michael Bosnick and Sarah Sanchala from DIFTA who will be available to answer questions. After I say the oath, I will call each of your names. Please wait for me to call your name and respond one by one. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Sadia Sherman? I do. Yes. Yuka, Yuka Buskit? I do. Merlene Shallow? I do. Michael Bosnick? I do. Sarah Sanchala? I 
I do. Thank you. You may begin when ready. Thank you. Chairs Alika Amprey Samuel and Chair Chen, members of the Committees on Public Housing and Aging and other distinguished members of the City Council, NYCHA residents and members of the public, good morning. I'm Sadia Sherman, NYCHA's Executive Vice President for Community Engagement and Partnerships. I'm pleased to be joined by Yuka Buzgif, Senior Director of NYCHA, NYCHA's Family Partnership Department, as well as our partner, partners at the New York City uh, Department for the Aging. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss NYCHA's efforts to support seniors aging in place, including during the COVID-19 pandemic, as that is as a mission that is one of our top priorities. Over the past year, the coronavirus has brought immeasurable loss and disruption to our lives, sparing no spot on the planet. I'd like to take a moment to remember all that we have lost. Every one of us have been deeply affected by the pandemic and it has brought to light deep inequities and disparities around the globe related to health, economics, and connectivity. This extraordinary crisis has compelled us to come together as a world, as a nation, as a city to defeat it. I've seen remarkable demonstrations of this cooperation, this perseverance over the past 13 months. The resident leaders who organized food drives and PPE distribution and conducted their own informal wellness checks of neighbors the hardworking NYCHA employees who came to work every day when many in the city were sheltering in place to keep the heat on and the elevators running and to keep our buildings clean. The staff in my department who communicated daily with residents and helped coordinate the distribution of food and other essentials and to do outreach on COVID-19 testing and now on vaccinations. And the community and government partners who assisted with all these efforts, including members of the city council. While these challenges are unprecedented, so too is the sense of ingenuity, strength, resilience, and community. Throughout the crisis, NYCHA has been following guidance from federal, state, and local experts to ensure our policies and procedures are thorough and responsive to a rapidly changing environment. The pandemic has stressed the importance of timely and accurate information and communication. Since day one, we have been working nonstop to amplify the guidance from our partners within the city of New York, including the city's health, health department to inform residents and employees of the best health and safety practices to, to, to follow during the pandemic. As of April 2nd, we have delivered approximately 4.5 million COVID-19 related communications via robocalls, person-to-person -person calls, emails, mailings, rent inserts, and other outreach methods to residents and resident leaders. Section 8 residents, employees, elected officials, as well as advocates. To our social media reach of about 47 million, we've posted about COVID-19 over 1,300 times between March and April of last year to this year, as well as on all of our social media, across all of our social media channels. We dedicated a page to our website for COVID-19 resources, and we've also posted important information and updates within the NYCHA Journal, the NYCHA Journal which is our digital newspaper for residents. The COVID-19 safety posters we put up at all of our more than 2,200 buildings provide information in five languages and other informational notices we distributed were available in 13 languages. During the pandemic, the hardworking staff from our community engagement and partnerships team made over 120,000 wellness phone calls to our most vulnerable residents, including seniors, to make sure they understood how they can stay safe, determine how they had, determine whether they had any special needs, and connect them to resources from DIPTA and other partners. And we partnered with New York Cares, a volunteer organization to provide seniors with, uh, to, provide, to provide seniors with a buddy who can make routine phone calls um, to those requesting regular checks and other types of assistance. Those calls are ongoing. We send a newsletter to more than 230 resident association leaders two to five days a week to keep them informed about COVID-19, our efforts in key NYCHA and city resources. At the height of the pandemic, we had almost daily phone calls with the chair of the Citywide Council of Presidents and spoke with other resident leaders about two to three times per week, representing nearly 30,000 calls since the start of the pandemic. We also hosted 11 resident advisory board meetings and are hosting monthly webinars for resident leaders with senior NYCHA and city officials to discuss COVID-19. 
In November, we implemented weekly standing meetings with the CECOM and NYCHA's executive staff, including Chair Russ. And we provide elected officials with regular updates, including a now weekly newsletter specifically for elected officials and community partners. NYCHA's intergovernmental relations team has held nearly 500 external meetings to date to brief elected officials, their staff, and other community partners on the authority's COVID-19 response and needs. And we respond to inquiries in real time. We have also hosted 18 teletown halls to provide updates and guidance to thousands of participants. And we are conducting informational webinars for advocates and as well as industry groups within their forums. These communication efforts will continue to ensure that all of our residents, including seniors, have the latest information and resources to keep themselves safe. At the very beginning of the crisis, NYCHA suspended resident evictions for as long as the city is under a state of emergency to help our families stay healthy and housed. In addition, we closed our hearing offices and adjourned all cases before the housing court. We also simplified our rent hardship policy to make it easier for residents to apply. In only a few weeks, we amended a process that was admittedly burdensome for residents to be able to benefit from it. Now, with just a few clicks on a computer or by answering a few questions with a customer contact representative, residents can request a rent adjustment due to partial or full loss of income. There is no waiting period to apply and residents can self-certify their loss of income. Our rent our rent hardship policy is a powerful safety valve for families who lost work or income due to COVID-19 and a core feature of this stabilizing institution because our rent is generally capped at 30% of adjusted gross income. As of the end of March, NYCHA decreased rent for nearly 65,000 families in public housing and over 6,000 in Section 8. Since day one, we have been working with the city working with city agencies and community partners to connect residents to food, medication, and essential health and social services during this crisis, including COVID testing, to help keep residents safe, healthy, and informed. As we now embark on an unprecedented vaccination effort, NYCHA has worked hand in hand with the city to ensure NYCHA seniors have access to crucial information and locally available vaccine. In January, 2021, NYCHA and the city opened weekend vaccination clinics at three initial NYCHA developments through which more than 2,000 seniors were vaccinated. Since then, NYCHA has continued to operate roving pop-up to help operate roving pop-up vaccination clinics at developments throughout the city, reaching a total of over 60 NYCHA sites so far. I have visited many of these vaccination clinics and I'm proud to say that they are real signs of hope and renewal after what has been a long and difficult NYCHA works closely with the on-site DIPTA senior center providers to host and help enroll residents for appointments. These efforts are a key part of the city's work to ensure equitable distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine, including by making the vaccine available in neighborhoods hardest hit by the virus and addressing vaccine hesitancy at the community level. As of April 1st, 2021, we have launched seven of 11 long-term NYCHA vaccination clinics that will serve that will serve communities with a high concentration of NYCHA housing. These clinics will serve all eligible NYCHA residents staying open for at least four to 18 weeks. To spread awareness about vaccine clinics and to help residents make appointments, NYCHA continues to promote the city's vaccine for all campaign through all of our communication channels. Our outreach efforts are robust and include flyers, robocalls, thousands of person-to-person -person calls, emails to residents and social media promotion. NYCHA has also trained key community engagement and partnership staff to be vaccine navigators, integrating vaccine messaging and resource navigation into routine outreach work. In partnership with the New York City Department of Health, we are also hosting community conversations for NYCHA residents to learn more and ask questions about the COVID-19 vaccine and on-site vaccination clinics. Interpre interpretation services are available at all of these virtual sessions. We also work with our city and community partners to get the word out and assist our older and vulnerable, to, to get up the word out and assist our older and vulnerable residents. New York City Health and Hospitals, Test and Trace staff and our community engagement and partnership staff organize door knocking campaigns at developments and enroll residents for vaccination appointments through direct phone call. At the height of the pandemic, NYCHA and the city worked to enroll all eligible residents in the Get Food New York City program. We also instituted bulk food delivery at many of our senior buildings and hired residents to assist with the delivery process. NYCHA also worked with a variety of partners to help organize pop-up food distribution events and other targeted meal delivery programs. We would like to thank all of our partners, 
including members of the council for your assistance with these vital efforts. Early in the pandemic, we installed hand sanitizer dispensers at all of our senior buildings and to help our senior buildings, uh, our seniors stay cool and safe at home, NYCHA provided air conditioners to more than 16,000 households last summer through Mayor Bill de Blasio's heat wave plan to protect vulnerable New Yorkers. And the city has provided free tablets and internet services to more than 10,300 NYCHA seniors to help them stay connected to their friends and family, as well as critical online resources. Thanks to DIPTA and uh, Older Adults Technology Services, or OATS, NYCHA seniors can connect to, senior, to the Senior Planet Hotline, which is staffed by OATS certified multilingual trainers for assistance with technology and accessing beneficial resources such as how to participate in exercise classes or city council hearings, order medication or food, or socialize with friends and family online. At nearly 3,000, and nearly 3,000 seniors have participated in virtual trainings, workshops, and activities from OATS on topics ranging from how to use Zoom and Android to bilingual game nights. Through a partnership, NYCHA connects seniors to a range of supportive and other services. Our goal is to ensure seniors have access to quality programs and services so they can age in place safely and gracefully. This has always been our mission and it has continued during the pandemic. Across our portfolio, NYCHA seniors have access to 108 senior centers and 11 naturally occurring retirement community programs operated by settlement houses and long and other long-standing community-based organizations. The senior centers provide one-on-one -on -one counseling as well as recreational and cultural opportunities from, department, from the Department of Aging and many other providers. At 11 NORC sites, homebound and non-homebound seniors are connected to services and get help with accessing public benefits and improving their health. Throughout the pandemic, many providers converted to virtual services and person-to-person -person calls to keep seniors engaged. To enhance services, we have continued to formalize referral partnerships with local service providers to offer direct case management and other assistance to NYCHA residents citywide. Through our HUD-funded Elderly Safe at Home program, NYCHA family, NYCHA family partnership staff assist seniors at 17 distinct senior-only senior only properties to support themselves uh, to live safely and independently within their homes. Through the ESAH program, staff provide home visits and connections to services and crime prevention and other workshops, and they organize volunteer floor captains to, facilitate, to, to facilitate neighbor to neighbor support. Citywide, our family partnerships team responds to referrals submitted by property management and other NYCHA departments for vulnerable residents with social, financial, behavior, behavioral, and or mental health concerns that place their tenancy at risk. Throughout this universally challenging experience, we remain guided by our top priority, promoting the health, safety, and quality of life of residents, including seniors. We will continue to share the latest guidance and information with our residents and do all we can do to connect them to life-saving resources and services. I again would like to thank the council, the city, the state, and our community partners for their support which is enabling us to overcome this pandemic and continue to transform the agency. I would also like to thank our residents and our resident leaders who are also out on the front lines of this pandemic, helping to keep their neighbors safe. When this chapter in New York City's history is written, it will show that community and resolve made an incredible difference in how we surmounted this extraordinary challenge. We are all in this together and we are up overcoming it together. I would also like to note that our partners at DIPTA who are with us today are best positioned to comment on the two pieces of legislation that are being considered as part of this hearing. Thank you, and we look forward to continuing to update you on our work, and we are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Ms. Sherman, for your testimony. Mm -hmm. um, we have also been joined by council member Helen Rosenthal and council member Ayala. And um, because we are hearing from both NYCHA and DIFTA, I want to, um, in an organized way, I'll focus my questions um, to NYCHA in the best way that I can um, and be able to go back and forth and allow for um, Chair Chen to be able to ask questions to DIFTA. And so I'm gonna try to make this make sense. <laughs> um, 
so first with NYCHA, can you explain to me or to us who does what for the seniors at NYCHA exclusively? Um, and I know that at the end of your testimony, you mentioned um, family partnerships, you mentioned family services and the Elder Safe at Home program, uh, but can you just flesh out um, just your organizational structure and explain to us um, at NYCHA who is working and focusing exclusively on the seniors? Sure, thank you for your question, council member. Um, so within our family partnerships department, um, we have a team that's focused on serving residents who are, may have to be vulnerable or at risk. And typically this is connected to tenancy. So we have a citywide team that's organized at the borough level um, that responds to referrals, typically from property management, but they can be external to the agency as well, um, where we would provide support to residents who may be experiencing behavioral, mental health, or other challenges. A, tip, a, a significant portion of our referrals are seniors, but they may be other vulnerable residents. Our role is to assess, provide assistance, create a case plan for those residents and then connect them to the right city agency or the right partner. In terms of senior activities and cultural and recreation programs, um, that work is really led by the Department for the Aging and the providers who are on campus. So as I shared, we have over 100 senior centers, over, uh, over 10 with 11 NORC programs across our campus. And so our role is to really ensure that those providers are connecting to residents as a primary source of service. Um, in addition to that, we have through grant funding, the ability to staff within buildings, um, uh, an elderly safe at home program. So these buildings, uh, th this program has been targeted to 17 properties um, with an effort to focus on the properties where there are service gaps, um, where we have staff who are on site and provide direct case assistance through this grant funded program. So, you know, our structure is to really facilitate coordination and access to services. We have a network of partners, many of whom are the VIFTA senior centers who are on, on the ground. We share information, we promote those services and connect residents. We intervene in issues that um, are typically tied to tenancy or other you know, uh, typical landlord issues and provide that social service support. Um, and then through grant funded programs, we have staff who are on site at targeted properties. Um, so just for clarification, there you don't have like a certain amount of social workers like 10 social workers who exclusive of job and, and duty is to only work on your senior population that doesn't exist? No, so I mean, we have a small team of social workers and clinical social workers that respond to referrals for all vulnerable residents. Some certainly specialize, um, a significant number of our referrals are hoarding referrals, for instance, right, which are typically seniors, but they are not exclusive to seniors. Based on our staffing, and the capacity that we have um, that in that skill set within our team, those folks, those staff members are leveraged across our portfolio for residents who are at risk of, of all ages. Okay, thank you. Um, and next, um, what initiatives did the city administration create to help seniors in NYCHA maintain their health during the COVID-19 pandemic? Sure, so um, during the pandemic, we worked across all of our city agency partners to outreach to seniors and other vulnerable residents. Um, you know, food was a significant need that we saw across the city and particularly in NYCHA. And we partnered um, with the city to, you know, have a specific focus on NYCHA within the Get Food Program. So I'm sure council member, you and, and your colleagues are familiar with the Get Food Program, which offers um, free at home meal deliveries to, to residents. Um, as part of that initiative, we identified a target of not only enrolling NYCHA residents in the program for individual meal delivery, but in developments where there were high concentrations of seniors, we also um, enrolled those developments into a bulk delivery program um, that was in part managed by NYCHA, um, where we had staff on board who delivered to these buildings. Um, in the bulk delivery program, residents were automatically enrolled and had to opt out instead of opting in so that we made sure those resources got to them immediately. Um, in addition, as I shared in my testimony, um, NYCHA also was able to um, provide over 16,000 air conditioners to NYCHA residents 
um, to seniors particularly um, throughout the pandemic to make sure that they were able to keep cool and stay safe in their home. Um, the city also put in place the tablet distribution program through the, the, the chief technology office, which provided over 10,000 tablets to NYCHA seniors again so that they can stay connected and stay safe in their home. Um, the city facilitated mailing of PPE to every single NYCHA, every single NYCHA household. Um, which is inclusive of our seniors. Um, and then, you know, again, with our partners at the Department for the Aging, we facilitated a number of food distributions, outreach events, um, and other types of um, uh, activities to ensure that seniors were connected to city resources. So question, how were you able to communicate directly with the residents themselves? Um, can you just talk through your work with the city agencies um, in communication and direct like education and um, even trainings to make sure that they were connected. Um, because, you know, you, I, I read in, well, you read in the testimony that there were a certain amount of phone calls that were made, um, you know, but a phone call is different from actually um, landing. Like you can count for a phone call that was made, but what happened on the other end? Did the person pick up? And when they picked up, what was the follow-up? So can you um, just- yes. You know, explain that process. Yes, council member. Um, so we worked to have a uniform script between NYCHA and the Department for the Aging um, for outreach to seniors so that all seniors, NYCHA residents in particular, um, were receiving the same information and we trained a number of our staff in the, the call script um, and the resources that were available within the call script so that there was a uniform way that seniors were connected. Um, and I'm sorry, I hope you can hear me, but there's drilling behind me. I hope you'll be able to hear me clearly. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we made over 127,000 calls. Um, those calls were to 77,000 households. Um, so these are households that had a senior, at least one senior in the household. These are also, this also includes households that um, may have had a person who's on life-sustaining equipment or- Can you go back to that, Sadia? You said you made 100 and what? 127,000 calls. And then to 77,000 households, and we had about a 62% success rate with those calls in terms of being able to speak with someone and get them the information that they were requesting. Um, we also um, uh, auto generated uh, mailings to those seniors as well, too, with calls. Um, and then we, uh, you know, also work with partners on the ground to make calls to seniors. So, in some developments, we were able to have seniors consent for NYCHA to share their information with the on site provider. And we were able to provide that information for seniors, for the provider to have ongoing calls. We also um, were able to facilitate a data match with DIFTA, where we were able to identify NYCHA residents who were already DIFTA clients, um, so that we were not duplicating calls to those residents, and we could better focus our efforts. So there was coordination throughout to make sure that there was um, a consistently uh, consistency and a uniform process. Is there a process in place for receiving um, input and feedback from the seniors? Um, and if so, what is that process and what did you do or what do you do with that information? Sure, so we have, so we received feedback from our staff um, as a result of calls and constantly adapted the script based on what we heard people's needs were. Um, I would say at least each month there were some adaptations to the script based on what we were hearing from seniors and what their needs were at that time. Um, we did not have a formal survey process for seniors, um, but we certainly uh, were able to constantly adapt the script based on new resources that were available or what we heard seniors needed. I mean, you know, many of the seniors we connected to also shared that they had personal um, systems of support in place, which, you know, is very encouraging. Um, and so as we also continued our calls and, and um, outreach efforts, we also gave seniors an opportunity to opt out of, of receiving consistent calls from NYCHA, um, where they were expressing that they, um, you know, wanted to do that and were receiving calls from a number of agencies, including NYCHA. So um, with that, has there been a significant decrease in um, the number of calls to the seniors because they have, you know, decided to opt out or because of the change in the dynamics, more um, seniors or more New Yorkers are getting vaccinated? Do you see a difference? Sure. So the initial call campaign um, that was really tied to the first wave and, and sort of the peaks in the second wave ran through March through September. And seniors who identified it, who identified a need for ongoing consistent calls were referred to DIFTA or to New York CARES 
or to a community-based provider that would offer that. Um, so those seniors, for instance, um, would still be receiving calls. Some are enrolled in case management or are still requesting um, that call. But there were other seniors who got the information that they needed, expressed that they wouldn't need further calls or did not need other supportive services. Um, during the fall, I will say, however, um, we also completed a mailing to all NYCHA households, including seniors, again, sharing COVID information and emphasizing the city's messaging around gatherings during the holidays. We've continued to message to those households. But those requiring ongoing buddy systems or calls or case management services were handed off to um, and connected to providers. Okay. Um, we've also been joined by Council Member Kuhl. So I want to recognize Council Member Kuhl's attendance. Um, so, the, so we've heard from um, Mr. Norvell, Mr. John Derrick Norvell earlier. And I would like for you to just speak to, as we get into questions and I'll end my questions um, around maintenance and repairs and then kick it off to co-chair Chen. Um, so I would like for you to speak to um, what we heard from John Derrick Norvell this morning, because if we're doing wellness checks and we are making sure um, that our senior issues are addressed during the pandemic, it's great to be able to let folks know about where they can go get tested and you know going downstairs in the, in the center to get a vaccination. Um, but if you can't wash your hands properly, you know what are we doing? And so um, again, can you can you respond to Mr. Norvell's testimony? And then I would like to um, hear about how you are prioritizing the repair needs and maintenance needs um, in our senior buildings. Sure. So yes, and um, and I apologize to Mr. Norvell for what he's experiencing. Um, so we, I'm looking into exactly what's occurring at Lincoln Houses. I think that's the development that he shared, but in general, um, we have uh, had a process where we have suspended most planned outages during the pandemic, um, unless there's a critical repair need. Um, and those are going through a chain of approval and escalated before there's approval given to property management um, or our skilled trades team to have a water shutdown um, in order to address repair needs. So a lot of routine plans, scheduled outages that are tied to work have been paused. Um, my understanding is that Lincoln Houses, there's significant capital projects um, under, underway. Um, and this water outage uh, is most likely it was tied to that work. Um, but we can get the specifics. Um, in all instances, however, residents should receive firsthand um, and advance notice. Um, if it's an emergency, they would also receive notice if it happens unexpectedly. Um, and there should also be updates that are indicating the timeline and the estimated duration of the outages. For the, the outages tied to the capital work at Lincoln Houses, my understanding that outage was supposed to be four hours. Um, so we can certainly check and make sure that um, we address the issues that are, are happening at that development in particular. Okay, thank you. But, um... I, I do want to stress that it's not unique to Lincoln um, because I know for a fact that we've had a significant um, number of constituent calls from other developments in my district. And one in particular is our, our Brown houses, which is a senior only development. And they were without water they were without hot water and water mm -hmm. um, in both buildings, 333 Thomas Boyle and 636 St. Mark's for, um, for some time in addition to some other issues um, in their building. And so, um, you know, again, it's not unique to Lincoln. And so I really did wanna know um, are senior developments or buildings with a high proportion um, of vulnerable residents prioritized at all in terms of repairs? So buildings that um, have seniors or stair holes with seniors are typically prioritized for um, service outages. And um, throughout the pandemic, NYCHA has continued to make emergency repairs and still has 24 hour crews available. Um, we still have the same aging infrastructure, however. So there are you know, certainly outages that are unanticipated um, that have happened throughout the pandemic. And you know, we have 
ensure that emergency teams come out to address them. Um, but when we also make calls to seniors, whether we're scheduling a vaccine appointment, for instance, um, our team is able to also identify if there are work ticket issues or needs, and we certainly escalate those um, to our property management team and our, our skilled trades teams as well. Okay, so it's the same process. So the, the residents would have to, you know, call in the same 707 number, get a, 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 a ticket, and it's just the same regular process. Um, so there's no, um, like, heightened alert where, you know, folks would deploy because it's a senior building or population, or there's an exclusive um, ESD team just for seniors, like, during the pandemic. I just wanted to make sure wanted to be clear about it's the same process and it's still an aging structure like we all know that the buildings you know have a lot of capital repaired needs and concerns um however you know we do know that there are buildings that are exclusively for seniors and so even amongst the entire 302 developments we know that this you know this select group of buildings you know because of who lives there there would be a different response. So I was just trying to figure out if there was a different response. Sure, so, and I can just clarify my, my response. So individual work tickets are prioritized based on the work, um, right? So emergency work tickets are treated as emergencies and they're triaged in that way in terms of outages. So a, a building system is out. Um, there is a process for prioritizing uh, the, you know, buildings that have seniors, vulnerable residents, as well as ensuring that there's outreach. And, 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 in, and, in, and in the instance of Lincoln Houses in particular, we can look into what's happening there, but that's the, that should be the protocol generally. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll stop there. I have a thousand other questions, clearly. Um, I'll stop there and um, turn it over to Chair Chin. Thank you. Um, I know there's a lot of questions and uh, I'll, I'll start with a few and I know that other council member have their hands raised. So um, I just wanna to touch on the two pieces of legislation. Um, and I, I do want NYCHA and DIFTA to address it because it's, I don't think it's just um, um, DIFTA being able to be so responsible. I think NYCHA gotta to work together on this and the legislation that, um, that you know, Chair, and for Samu, uh, sponsor, which calls for a, uh, a liaison within the Department for the Aging with NYCHA. Uh, is there a, I know we've heard that there's this mem memorandum of understanding between NYCHA and DIFTA. Um, is, that, is that a fact? I mean, is there a, a MOU between the two agency um, that talks about guidelines and procedures and how two agencies work together uh, dealing with um, senior centers and seniors living in, uh, in nature building. Thank you for your question, council member. So at present time, there is not an active MOU between DIFTA and NYCHA, um, but many of, much of what we would want in an MOU is currently in place. Um, so NYCHA has a dedicated point within its operations division um, for being the liaison to DIFTA when there are repair issues. Um, and that position reports to a, a VP, so it's also elevated so that there's visibility on concerns as they are raised. Um, with respect to DIFTA, and I can turn to my colleagues to speak more to that, DIFTA also now has baseline funding to address repair issues as well, which was much of the, um, the, 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 the discussions, right, in our early discussions around the MOU getting to that place. And so while we have not actively um, we had not actively advanced those discussions during the pandemic. A lot of what we were looking to include in the MOU was put in place. Um, and so we looked to formalize that. And I can turn to uh, my DIFTA colleagues. To, to elaborate. Well, I think once, once you formalize that, we would love to, um, to have a copy of it. And then also, I think in your testimony, you were talking about um, there's I guess a hundred senior centers that are located in nature development. Yes, council members. So there, there are a hundred senior centers, um, and there are eleven work programs. That's a, a huge portfolio. I mean, 
what NYCHA, I mean, um, DIFTA Senior Center is only about, what, 249? And uh, 100 out of 249, that's a large, that's a large number. And uh, I think that in terms of like making sure that these senior centers are being taken care of, um, it's crucial. And I guess I'll, I'll turn my question over um, to DIFTA, because we're asking uh, legislation 415 that, um, that I sponsor, want to have a more uh, closer working relationship between NYCHA Senior uh, Center and DIFTA, and also how do we, how did DIFTA monitor those programs uh, in terms of um, the offering, um, the repair that's needed. I remember um, in 2018, distinctively, I think from, uh, I think it's from Cal Council Member Salamanca, but he's going to ask the question later. In terms of some pictures of horrible conditions um, in our senior center inside NYCHA, where the ceilings are leaking and like waters were collecting and it was like a plastic wrap. Uh, and, I, it, and so I think that how is DIFTA uh, monitoring these programs within NYCHA and making sure that um, the repairs are done and, and the conditions are corrected. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Osnick. My colleague, uh, uh, Merlene Shallow is going to answer that question for us. Thank you, Council Member, for that very important question. So um, as it stands, um, we, do have a centralized person at NYCHA whenever there are um, on the ground um, facility issues that need attention. We do have a very good working relationship with NYCHA. Um, we interact with NYCHA on many levels. Many senior centers and NOFs are located within NYCHA development and through the contracted providers for those locations, we are engaging regularly just like with any other center or NOC, we have con contact with whom we are engaged as needed. We partner with NYCHA on other targeted programs as well, um, such as the, tar um, um, the tablet distribution or PPE distribution. Um, we do have a, a very good working relationship and we are happy to discuss this further with you, with NYCHA and with our sponsors. So I assume you are supportive of both legislation um, that we have introduced? Thank you so very much for that question. We do support the intent of the bill and we do look forward to working with you and NYCHA on this proposal. As you may know, um, Council passed Local Law 140 in 2018, which requires reporting of all our senior centers, including those housed in NYCHA. This report also includes um, daily average participant numbers of meals, service units, health promotion and education and rec and weighted utilization. Um, so we will be happy to discuss this with you further, but yes, we do support the intent of the bill. Okay, I think we're, we'll look forward to working with you on that. Um, so I guess with uh, DIFTA is that, what is the current status of the plan to reopen our senior centers <laughs> and the NYCHA social club safety? Council member, thank you for that question. That's a very good question being asked by you and so many others. So um, the, the safety of our older New Yorkers as well as all New Yorkers is our top priority. And any decision to open in-person or congregate service is gonna be guided by public health authorities. Um, as we look to transition, um, the in-home vaccination program deploys teams, um, deploys teams of nurses and did the entry professionals to vaccine sites. But um, right now that is a priority now that the rollout of the vaccine services has begun. We remain hopeful for the inevitable reopening of our centers. It remains to be determined exactly when congregate services will be reopened. But in the interim, senior center providers continue to serve their members virtually and remotely. Our mutual hope 
is to return to some sense of normalcy as soon as it is safe to do so for the sake of our older adults. I know. I mean, our seniors are asking when they can go back to their senior center to get the nutritious meal that they enjoy so much. When are they going to be able to see their friends? Schools are opening, I'm right? I mean, restaurants yeah. are increasing capacity. How come our senior centers don't are not a priority to be safely that's, open? That's my good chin. I like her. You know, we, I mean, we got it. We got to have. I don't. I don't even see a plan. Because every time I've asked the commissioner, she's like, yeah, we're hoping soon. What is soon? Uh, we got, you know, so, schools are reopened. How come our senior centers are not, right? We got to have some definitive answer to that. Uh, because our seniors are asking, look, we want them to be safe. We understand that. Um, the, other, the other thing relating to that is that now the senior centers are closed, right? They're not open, even though I know our providers are doing a wonderful job in uh, providing virtual program, but there are a lot of seniors that have repair issues. So can you um, tell us uh, in between you and, and NYCHA, are some of the senior centers that had repair issue, are they being taken care of during the pandemic? While the centers are closed, are those repairs being done? Um, currently, yes. I would say yes, because um, we have seen incentives while they're closed for congregate services. Um, the staff do have a hybrid um, format of remote and on-site, um, working remote and on-site. So they are able to assess if repairs are needed and if the repairs are needed, that those repairs are being addressed. Um, I think we would like to get a list of all the centers that are uh, getting their repair um, during the pandemic, especially uh, the NYCHA senior centers and NYCHA NORC um, that request the repair. So can we have that list? Sure, that Can you forward that list to us? Yes, we will. Okay, that would be helpful. Um, Chair Andrew Samuel, I'm gonna, we, I think we should pass on to some of the council member who's been waiting and then we can always come back. Thank you. Yes. And when we come back, I do want to follow up on one of your MOU questions and, um, and how are we advocating on behalf of seniors. So I'll jump in after. Okay, um, committee council. Great, thank you. Uh, I will now call on council members to ask questions in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand functions function. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, including time for answers. Uh, Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer. Uh, we will now take questions from Council Member Ku, followed by Council Member Salamanca. Time starts now. Hello. Hi. Thank you, uh, both chairs of the committees, and, and thank you, um, Vice President Sherman. Oh. Hello. Yeah. I, uh, oh? You can hear your council member. Oh, I can go ahead. I thought I lost you because I dropped my <laughs> my iPad. Yeah, we still hear you, me. Right? Okay. So my question is, uh, uh, you mentioned in your testimony about the iPads for senior uh, uh, residents. Well, I have a lot of echoes. Okay, then I think I get back now, yeah. Thank you. So our, standing, our understanding is that NYCHA provided IPACs to senior residents to provide internet access. However, we've heard from seniors at three uh, developments in my district, Plan House, Latima, and 34th Street, uh, Levy, that they weren't able to access the iPad, the iPad program because they had run out. How was distribution of the iPads determined? All right, thank you for your question, council member. So um, in collaboration with DIPTA and the CTO's office, um, we you know, facilitated the distribution of over 10,000 10, iPads. The distribution was um, prioritized for seniors who lived alone and lived in neighborhoods that had low broadband adoption. 
Um, so th those were the first rounds of outreach that was completed. So we issued calls to seniors who live in those communities and um, meet that criteria, living alone, um, as our first wave of outreach. And then future wave of outreach as supply was available was made to um, seniors citywide who lived alone. Um, we did this via robocall. We also worked with our partners in the senior centers, as well as many elected officials helped get the word out um, so that seniors could take advantage of the program. So there were none available for for NYCHA residents in my district? There are, there are I've had, I, excuse me, tablets available um, for NYCHA residents across our portfolio. So we can certainly follow up with you, council member, and share um, iPads that were issued within your specific district. Um, but, it, but the priorities were um, communities based on um, the, the city's uh, chief technology office that are, are known for broad, low broadband adoption um, and then expanded to NYCHA seniors who live in citywide. But we can certainly identify um, seniors and tablets that were distributed within your district in particular. Okay, so you, you communicate with us, right? So yes, how do NYCHA, yeah. So how did LIGHTER get uh, information, get important information about the pandemic to seniors or to the other residents uh, who don't speak English? Uh, specifically in my area, we have a lot of Chinese and Korean speaking seniors. You know? How you communicate with them? Because you mentioned in your testimony, you, you have tried different ways to communicate with the uh, LIGHTER residents. Yes, council member. So typically, um, NYCHA communicates in five languages um, as our primary languages. During the pandemic, we increased that to 13. Um, so all of our NYCHA materials were translated into 13 languages. Um, in addition to the city's materials from the Department of Health, which are, which are also translated into a number of languages, um, that was used across all of our platforms. Um, we also, as we made individual robocalls, all of our staff have been trained in using language line and know how to add language line as a third party. Um, if we are speaking with someone and we don't, um, are not able to speak in their given language. Um, and as we've rolled out in partnership with the city vaccination sites across NYCHA developments, we've also worked to make sure that on-site translation service is available. Um, we also have partnered with our community-based organizations, as I shared, where um, we work to you know, provide outreach in, in, in our NYCHA developments and connect people to services that were on the ground. And many of these are organizations that are multilingual and, and culturally competent um, and do that work within the communities. And so we also work with them um, on our volunteer efforts and other distribution efforts. But we've made sure that our, our materials have been translated and that interpretation services are available um, at any of the convenings that we've had. You, you, you mentioned 13 languages. You know, does that include Korean and Chinese? I can get the list of Chinese for sure. Chinese is one of our standard five. Um, I can follow up and just confirm what the 13 languages are. Um, and we can probably get that to you by the end of the hearing. Okay. So uh, my next question is probably, uh, I don't know, to you or to, to NYCHA. Uh, Brand House in my district, they used to have a NYCHA senior center. Uh, but who is responsible for the Brand Center uh, now? The senior center is closed. What, what services were provided uh, to residents during the pandemic? Then my last question, yeah. Um, Councilman, I would take that question. This is Victor. So um, all congregate sites, um, which include senior center and social clubs, are still on the executive order 100, which ordered all the close of all in-person congregate services at our neighborhood centers. Um, we continue to have conversations with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And once we advise that we will open, we will. But right now, RAISIS is um, providing services at that site, but the site is closed on the Executive Order 100. Okay, right. thank you. And council member, if I may return to your question regarding languages. Um, so our standard, our five covered languages that we always use for translation are English, Spanish, uh, traditional Chinese, standard Chinese, and Russian. Um, during the pandemic, we included Arabic, French, Bengali, Haitian, Creole, Korean, Urdu, Yiddish, and Polish. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Chairs. 
Thank you. We will now take questions from Council Member Salamanca, followed by Council Member Ayala. Time starts now. Uh, yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, I just have some very basic questions. I have uh, the Melrose My Haven Senior Center uh, located at 372 East 152nd Street. And on top of the senior center is a NYCHA senior building. Um, fiscal year 18, we, um, I allocated $50,000 for surveillance cameras. NYCHA said it wasn't enough. Fiscal year 19, I allocated 225 for a grand total of $275,000. Can you tell me what's the status of the surveillance cameras in that senior building where there has been multiple robberies and holdups against my seniors? So Council Member Salamanca, I can get that information to you. Um, we can get that with, to you within the course of this hearing. I don't have it on hand, but we can give you a status. Okay, I would really appreciate that. Um, my, my other question is, I have a senior center uh, that's in a NYCHA facility in Adam Houses. And uh, there was an issue there with the kitchen, um, the gas, um, and their stove. There needed to be an outside plumber that needed to come in. Um, and this was pre-pandemic. Um, can you give me an explanation, an update as to what's happening in that senior center? So council member, we can also get you an answer on Adam's houses and the, the, the issue with the stove. I know across our portfolio, we sometimes have challenges restoring um, gas to our community facilities if the original hookup is not in line with DOB guidelines. Um, so we can certainly share the situation at Adams. I don't know that personally, but I will make sure to follow up and get that answer to you. Um, and with respect to the cameras um, that you referenced, um, that, that project is currently in the planning phase. Um, so we should be able to give you a timeline for when work starts. Um, where, where in the planning phase is it? So I typically it goes through design um, as part of the planning phase. We can give you a break, breakdown of the schedule. We'll get that to you. All right. Um, and then lastly, the Mount Haven Senior Center, uh, which is also, you know, in a NYCHA facility that is run by, I think it's Eastside Houses. Um, they, throughout my time as a council member in the last five years, you know, I've been advocating and communicating with NYCHA about the leaks. When it rains outside, it rains in the main kitchen. Um, in, I mean, in the main dining area. Um, the facility has been closed, obviously, for a year now. Uh, because of, the, you know, the pandemic. The, the NYCHA take advantage that there's no seniors in this facility to take the opportunity to actually address the problem inside that senior center in, in terms of the leakage when it rains? So I know that there has been ongoing work at that facility. Um, I can confirm what was accomplished during the pandemic. I know our property management teams have responded to, to that facility consistently. Um, and I can get that, that update for you um, and, and make sure that you have a breakout of all of the capital projects and repairs within your district. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chairs. Thank you. We will now take questions from Council Member Ayala. And again, a reminder to other council members, if you would like to ask any questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Council Member Ayala. starts now. Hi, good morning, everyone. I have three questions. Um, one of them is also security related because we also funded a series of layered access um, systems throughout some of our senior developments. And I understand that the company that was uh, responsible for that layout went bankrupt and is no longer operational. Um, I had an instance, I have a building that you can't get in anymore. The key fobs don't work. And then the side door, which when we initially funded a very expensive system. The idea was that if the side door was left open with a, you know, a rock or whatever, that that would then signal some sort of alarm to the company that will come and make sure that it was closed just to ensure, you know, an additional layer of safety for the seniors. And that has never happened. My staff was there yesterday because we we're doing construction of a sitting area um, and there's a lot of scaffolding and it's been a little bit dark. So we wanted to kind of, you know, assess what that looked like at night and the, the side door was completely open, um, posing you know, a threat to the senior. So I wonder what is NYCHA's uh, plan to you know, 
one, maybe find a new contractor to take over, uh, considering that those systems were really expensive. And then wondering um, if we know how many, if you could tell us how many senior buildings uh, benefit from on-site social services. I, I missed a little bit of it. I was at a, at a vaccine event, so I'm sorry if um, I'm asking a question that was already uh, answered, but um, the reality is that most of our seniors, you know, go to senior centers and some of them don't, right? We have to, we have to be prepared for both. Um, and senior buildings really, um, they house, you know, the most vulnerable. They should be equipped with a social worker. And the assumption that they will go to a senior center is not always accurate. Um, that's been my personal experience. Um, so I think that to DIFTA, so those are two questions for NYCHA, but then to DIFTA just so that, um, I would like to know if there's any additional support given to the senior centers to better outreach and market senior center services to NYCHA uh, seniors so that they feel more welcome and more comfortable coming into the senior center setting. So I guess NYCHA first. Thank you, council member. So to your first question, um, I will have to follow up with you on that. And, and thank you for sharing that. That's very concerning. So I think for the development you shared, we can immediately make sure that the access issue is addressed. Um, unfortunately, our safety and security and capital projects teams are not with me today. I can make sure that we get uh, a detailed update on what's happening with in terms of layered access and other projects at that development. Um, I know that you um, will receive a response from DIFTA on social services uh, within our buildings. Um, but there are 49 developments that are, that are senior only. So these are either fully senior only or partial, meaning there's a building within a, a, you know, a set of development, a campus that's senior only. Um, and I would say, and I'll get the exact number, less than 10 um, are without on-site services. And so a lot of this has been either met by DIPTA or our elderly safe at home program, um, or have been spaces where we've brought in nonprofit providers to be on site. Um, during the pandemic, we, um, uh, we're able to assign a, a team that focused on one of our developments that did not have coverage um, from any nearby senior provider. Um, and we also um, are working to bring more partners on site um, to, to the extent that we have space available. Um, I agree that you know, there's, there's a need for senior centers and programming, but also a need for dedicated social service work. So to the extent that we can between our grant programs as well as uh, partners, We've worked to bring more programs in the building and on site where we're seeing it. Yeah, I think there just needs to be a little bit more kind of more uh, effort made to ensure that there's a connection being made because I think that DIFTA is satisfied with the fact that there's a senior center in some of these senior buildings and the senior programs are already, you know, uh, stressed, you know, they're strained. They, they have limited resources and so they're providing the services that they're providing, but they're not necessarily you know, um, going into the building and posting, you know, this is the menu, we're going on a trip, you know, you're welcome to come with us, or we're having yoga, you know, like they're not doing that, that, that level of coordination rarely ever happens in my experience, and it shouldn't be that way. So by when, when the social workers were removed from the NYCHA buildings, it, it further, you know, uh, you know, made the situation, it made the situation worse. It just made the situation worse because now they didn't have the senior center and they didn't have the social workers that they were used to, that knew them, that understood, and quite frankly, are there more frequently to ensure that, you know, they didn't see Mr. Smith come down in three days, right? Or maybe they have a relationship with the mailman and the mailman is saying, you know, we haven't, you know, this this mailbox is full of, you know, has has a, a you know, significant amount of Time mail. It's like anyone is, you know, is coming to retrieve it. Can someone maybe knock on that door and find out what's happening? That that's important in senior buildings. And that's why I support the Section 202 model because it incorporates all of that. And NYCHA should really would really benefit from reconsidering how they provide senior services because I think that you can't house uh, you know, a, a number of vulnerable, you know, vulnerable population in a building and then kind of leave them there without that additional layer of support. So I think, thank, thank you for that, uh, Ms. Sherman. Um, I think, and I'm sorry, uh, Madam Chair, I went over my time. Of course, I appreciate that question because um, that's why I was asking, and Ms. Sherman knows, that's why I was asking the questions about the social workers because um, in my brain, I still remember, you know, 14 social workers assigned to um, the division and, you know, they was going to be working in the senior buildings. And, but I'm of course thinking about five, six years ago. 
um, you know, but yeah. so I, I appreciate that question. Did we ever hear from DIFSA about the, uh, the, the support services to ensure that the senior centers have? Can you repeat that question again? I didn't hear it quite clearly. So the, the question was in those buildings where a senior center and a, and a, and a senior building, a senior center is located in a senior building. Um, is there any additional support that DIFTA can or already provides to those senior centers to better market those services to the seniors that live in the buildings? Thank you so much for the question and thank you for repeating. It's a very important question. So the senior centers that are located in NYCHA sites, they establish committees that do outreach in the building. So, um, and they advertise their services. So while there might be a senior that might not want to come every day to a senior center, if there is a particular function that um, that is occurring in that center, um, this, if there is a social worker or a case manager on site, um, through their outreach efforts, that individual would be informed and if they would like to participate. But we encourage, again, we encourage our senior centers to do outreach, not just in the buildings, but in the surrounding area to encourage um, seniors to come in, at least come in and explore and see what possibilities there are, if there's something that they would like to engage in. Um, if not congregate services and they would like assistance with, you know, with case assistance or any other type of services, because there are a range of services that are provided in, um, in our neighborhood site. Michelle, that's not, isn't, that's not a requirement, right? It's a, it's a suggestion, right? Like it's, it's, it's not a requirement. It's just, you know, we encourage all seniors to participate. Um, I, 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 I get that. I'm sorry to, to interrupt you because I, I don't have enough time here, but I'm saying that your, the assumption is that the senior center is, is, is extending an invitation to the seniors that live in the building. However, with limited staffing and as much you know as that's happening at the senior center during the day, it becomes very difficult for them to focus their attention on the seniors inside of the building. So they need additional support in order to do that, or it has to be a requirement in their contract that they do that when they're situated in a building that, that is a NYCHA senior building, right? Um, that doesn't happen. So I, I, I appreciate, right, that we encourage people to do many things, but it, does, it doesn't mean that they do them. And it's not even, you know, it's not their fault. I don't fault them. I think they work really hard. Senior center staff, you know, work tremendously hard and um, are really underappreciated. And I think, you know, we have to recognize that, but they don't have those resources to do that. So I think that that's something that maybe if DIFLA could give a little bit of consideration to, it would help because uh, there's no reason why a senior center in a, in a senior building should have, you know, uh, they, should, they should be overwhelmed with the number of people that are coming every day. They should not be underutilized at all. And that is so duly noted. Um, Michael Bosnick, who's also on the panel, might be able to talk a little bit more about that. Michael, do you have any suggestions? This will be taken back on the advisement for further discussions. And we would like to engage you further, um, you know, for suggestions and to see how we can we can address this issue. Thank yes, you. I think uh, the one thing that I might add is that um, as part of our um, RFP process that we've been engaged in this year, we've gotten a lot of input from providers and providers have talked about outreach and marketing and how to reach uh, people uh, in the community in their buildings in the case of on-site services. So our RFP is addressing that both in terms of the kinds of outreach and marketing uh, that um, uh, should take place and making sure that there's some support for that in the uh, budgets that we uh, provide. So uh, we are looking uh, forward in that way to better marketing and outreach. And also we'll talk more internally about the specifics that you raised council member and see if we can think of additional supports to reach the community. I appreciate it, thank you. Thanks very much. If there are no other council member questions at this time, we will return to the chairs for additional questions. Okay, uh, so I wanna just 
um, you know, go back to my follow-up questions. So Marlene, you mentioned earlier uh, about waiting for guidance, um, you know, based on the executive order that was put out um, in order to reopen the centers. How do you really advocate for residents and, and how do you gather information and concerns and communicate that information back to the administration, either the, the, the mayor's office or the governor's office? Um, because I've realized, or we've all should have realized by now that we have to think outside the box, be very creative, and we can't wait for guidance because sometimes the people that are working in these offices don't know what we need on the ground. And so while we are waiting for, you know, someone to tell us what to do, uh, you know, have you been, you know, providing your suggestions to the administration on how you can open up and on how you can best provide services and resources to residents because the centers need to be open, you know, they need to be able to access the courtyard space and um, like there, there's a need and there's a way to be able to do things in a safe way, as opposed to waiting for um, you know, just procedures and the process and guidance from the administration. So what have you done, you know, at NYCHA or DIFTA to, um, to, to be able to get the centers um, reopened in an urgent way? Thank you, Council Member, for that question. Um, so DIFTA throughout the pandemic has been hosting monthly meetings with our board providers. The sentiments that you've just echoed, we are hearing from them as well. Um, our commissioner in her meetings um, have articulated the same sentiment. But again, as I stated before, we are a mayoral agency and we work, you know, we are under an executive order. And until they, we are advised otherwise, we have to um, we have to work under those guidance, under the public health guidance. And as soon as they indicate to us, um, we have lots of ideas and lots of programming to implement. But we want to make sure that when we open, it's safe. We have to follow the science. And so we want to ensure that the safety of all seniors is, that it's, is our number one priority. So yes, while we're hearing, and yes, it's, it's on the consideration, and we're getting all these wonderful ideas from providers from stakeholders, from elected officials, from our older adults, we're still on the executive orders. So until such so, time, um, we, we, yes? Kind of making me cringe. I try not to cringe. <laughs> we, are continuing to, we are continuing as best as possible to engage our seniors through no, our daily work. The seniors and the advocates, I mean, when, like how are you articulating that information back to the administration? Um, because I don't, I, like, I don't sit around and wait for anything. You know, I, if an idea pops up in my head, I am providing that information to the, like, I'm going to, like, I continue to talk to the administration about this is what you need to do. This is what my seniors are saying. This is what, you know, my residents are saying. And, and, and I know Brian and, and Nyche is on the call and, and I have given suggestions on, you know, what we can do around vaccination in Mount Albert houses, right? <laughs> like, you know, hey, you know, is there a contract in place with, with that particular development in that organization? No, there is not. Okay, well, what are we doing to make sure there's access to that development? And, and you know, these are a bunch of one-offs. So, like, is there, I was hoping to hear that there was, like, you know, some kind of formal strategy or, or you know, creative uh, way um, that you came up with, like, a plan, and that was submitted to the administration. So council member, um, I, I, as I said, I, you know, I, I share um, your sentiments and I am sure that there are discussions. What I would like to do is to take this back and um, speak to our executives at that level and try to get, you know, set something up so that that those discussions can be held with you if possible. We'd like to address this and discuss it further, providing more information to you. But I will definitely take it back to our executive executive level because I'm sure that they're having these discussions. 
And it'll just be helpful to, to tell us and you know let us know what's happening, what's being discussed and, and for the overall public as well. Um, because you know that's why people are always pissed off with government, quote unquote government, right? They're like it's it's there's no there's no creativity, there's no, you know, people just do business as usual. It's just always just checking a box and you know, just enough or just bare minimum. Um, and people, you know, clearly deserve more than that. Um, Understood. Yeah. Um, okay, I will take I will take that back, and we we welcome you know um, an engagement process with you where discussions can be further explored. I will take that back. Okay. Um, back to the MOU. <laughs> How many years have you been working on the MOU? I assume that this council member, this question is for NYCHA. Um, well, both of us. So this MOU has been an open issue for a number of years. Um, and I, I've been in this position at least four years. So at least since I've been in this position, but I know it preceded me and it's, it's been a lagging issue for a number of years. Um, and really the, the fundamental issue is less about roles and responsibility and more about funding. Um, and so, you know, I think what has changed now and, and is a, what makes this more of a reality is that DIPTA has funding that is baseline for repairs. And that's something that didn't exist before. Um, that allows us to have a clear role of responsibilities where NYCHA has the typical landlord responsibilities, building systems, stoppages, leaks from above, um, and DIFTA is able to manage um, HVAC system conversions, for instance, and other um, repair responsibilities that would typically fall within uh, that of a tenant. Um, now that we have that in place and, and it's baseline for future years, um, we will be able to move forward with this, this MOU and that has typically been our challenge. Um, during the pandemic, we had not resumed negotiations. Obviously, NYCHA's also had a number of changes in leadership during that, you know, since I've been in this capacity, um, but we're well positioned to, to finalize this now. And I think that has been what was the whole thing, the sticking point for, for quite some time. Okay. All right, I just wanted to bring that up because, you know, it, we built bridges in less time than it's taken to, to analyze, you know, this MOU. And I, with, I don't disagree. And how many attorneys work at NYCHA? And how many attorneys? It's, you know, it's, I just wanted to highlight that because uh, I would really hope that. The next conversation we have, it's not asking what's happening with the MOU. Um, uh, the poll sites. Um, Mr. Norvell mentioned the poll sites in his senior and how it was closed a couple of years ago. Um, what's the plan? Has there been a, a conversation, a plan about the upcoming June election and um, going into the senior centers and? Poll sites. Sure. So with um, poll sites, we receive um, notice from the Board of Elections every year of which locations, NYCHA locations, they're choosing for poll sites. And we work with the providers at DIPTA and DYCB to ensure that there's access. Um, and we did that during the pandemic as well. Um, my understanding, I think the poll site at Lincoln was changed because there's active construction in the, that center, um, which would prevent it from being safe for voting. I can look into that specific poll site and see why it was or wasn't uh, selected. Um, but the, typically the poll sites are confirmed from the Board of Elections, and then we would work to provide access to the space, the, the center provider or, or NYCHA, if there is not a center provider, would open and close and make sure that the space is available. And that will continue with every election. So I, I want to, I, I want to, um, you know, of course, emphasize just the irony here, right? So we can open up a senior center, a senior space for hours and hours and hours and have people on top of each other at the polling site and have hundreds of people go in and out of this space for election day with the Board of Elections. But the space is closed to the seniors that live in that building at a, and and the, the amount of seniors that would utilize that space is at a, a small fraction compared to election day. And so I just think that it's very interesting how, you know, 
certain agencies can work with NYCHA in utilizing a space for election day, but not be able to utilize that space to get a meal, to, you know, get on the computer or just check in to say that I'm alive. And so we have to do better. So that's going back to the conversation we just had about waiting for guidance on how to utilize and open up the space. But they are open, they will be open in, um, in June. They were open last June for the primary in 2020. Just wanted to, to highlight that point. I'll stop there um, for my co-chair. No, I totally agree with you because last summer during the, the height of the heat season, I think 80 um, senior centers were open as cooling centers. And I know that DIFTA has learned a lot from there. And what we're asking for is that a plan in place so that providers and seniors can have some expectation of what's going to happen. Uh, and we've heard from providers that even uh, have the center available for maybe even start off with like the counseling. If a senior wants to come in and talk to a social worker, have some you know forms filled out, uh, and that's not even available, and that should be available. Uh, what about you know having the the kitchen staff start cooking again and deliver the meals again, uh, or have senior comes in and just even grab the meal and be able to say hello to uh, staff and say hello to some of their friends. So we just want to see a plan in place that will say that we are planning to reopen the center safely and just let the public know and let our senior know that that uh, there's light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, it's like, it's not like a, something that is impossible. Um, I mean, we, we kept seeing it push back and push back. And even our school, right, they have hybrid. So why couldn't our senior center have a hybrid version? Uh, we, we just need to, to get some information on how we can start safely opening up um, these centers. So I really urge DIFTA to um, work on that with the provider and let the public know and let us know what is the plan and what is the date that we can expect uh, centers to gradually um, open back up. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, Ms. Sherman, you were talking about with the MOU that one of the reasons is that um, DIFTA has baseline funding. Uh, is that the funding for capital repairs? And how much is that? Because DIFTA's capital budget is very, very tiny. So are you talking about more money being allocated? So I, I will, um, thank you, Council Member, for that question. I will need to turn to DIFTA okay. to... Uh, clarify the, the funding and how they're how it applies to repairs. Yeah, Deputy Commissioner. Thank okay. you. Um, oh. I'm Director of Senior Centers. I'm Council okay. Member. So um, we we have four million dollars that was baseline into DIFTA's budget, and this funding covers repairs within senior centers housed within NYCHA sites. The current um, the amount of money and the majority of this is used for HVAC repairs, but it can also be applied towards other smaller repairs in service contracts, um, such, such as replacing window, um, window replacement, grease trap, electrical and plumbing and lift replacement. So to date, this has been enough to cover the cost of these additional repairs. That's still a very small budget because most of the money are actually coming from council members. Because I know my senior centers have asked me um, for repairs at their site. Um, and it, it's very, very expensive. Um, so I think that it's great that this money is baseline, but we definitely need to um, increase on it. And I also wanted to follow up on the question about the technology. Like from all the, is NYCHA really, is NYCHA working on getting internet access um, to all this, at least all the senior development 
because uh, I got two numbers here, so I don't know which one is um, correct. I thought there was only 17 NYCHA senior only building. And then I also heard 49. So how many standalone NYCHA senior building uh, there are in the NYCHA portfolio? Thank and you, I, Council Member. They plan to get internet access uh, to those buildings. Thank you, Council Member. So with respect to the number of buildings, so there are 49 partial or full senior buildings, either standalone senior buildings or standalone senior buildings connected to a multi-generational development. Um, this number 17 that I referenced is where we have the Elderly Safe at Home Program. Oh, okay. That is the HUD funded program that uh, NYCHA administers where we have on-site social services within 17 buildings. And those have been strategically allocated to fill the gaps between where DIPTA services are not. Um, and so that th those were the sites that I was referencing. Um, with respect to um, the broadband access and internet access, so it, as an immediate way to address connectivity, um, as I shared earlier, there was this habit distribution in partnership with the city to over 10,000 seniors, targeting seniors who lived alone um, and did not have connectivity, which some you know, may have connectivity uh, you know, devices within their household. Um, there are a number of NYCHA developments that are already connected to brand, broadband. The, the issue is not necessarily the connection, but the affordability. Um, and so the city has worked to also um, have new investment in broadband at NYCHA to provide affordable, low cost, no cost access. Um, there was a uh, request for expressions of interest last year for at least 20 developments. And I can share that list um, of locations where there would be providers that can come in and actually build a low cost, low cost uh, internet connection um, within 20 of our developments. And then there's a new RFP that went out just a few weeks ago um, that will use additional, you know, NYCHA spaces, city assets to provide broadband connectivity across more of our portfolio. And so those are longer term capital projects um, but with respect to the immediate need for connectivity, um, the tablet distribution program was used to target those folks, the seniors in particular who live alone. Okay, yeah, if you could provide us with uh, updated information on that, because I know that uh, some of the other uh, HUD 202 building, uh, I know there was one in my district uh, that I wanted a hearing or a discussion that I had with them, and they were able to get very inexpensive um, internet access into the whole building uh, so that the senior didn't really have to pay that much at all. And then also uh, the programs from the federal government uh, resources out there that NYCHA can also access. I mean, I think that is, uh, that is a key question in terms of cost. So we can really uh, make it very cost effective throughout the whole building. That solves the problem um, in terms of, you know, you don't have to get these expensive tablets. Um, so I think we, yeah, we, we do wanna see um, some updates on that. Um, so that would be very, very helpful. Uh, back to the capital uh, money, uh, maybe Dipta can answer. Um, how much was spent uh, on doing repairs um, in, the, um, in our senior building in the last three fiscal years? Do you have that information? Yeah. Um, thank you, Con thank you, Council Member Chain, for that question. Um, before I respond, can I just um go back to your statement regarding the um the budget? So um, our needs always um outpaces our resources, and so we are very proud that this uh, um to staff that has been working as we continue to do more with less. We sincerely appreciate the council's past advocacy for seniors in, and, and, and we are thankful to have the continued support of the committee and the chair, especially given the city's current fiscal situation. We would appreciate your partnership in lobbying Albany and Washington DC. And in response to your last question, we have spent about $2 million of that 4 million. Only two million out of four? Why so yes, slow? We still, because we still because it takes it takes a while to get the um especially now throughout the pandemic to replace the HVAC system with the HVAC systems that are needed. It takes a while to get that in place 
to the bidding process and procurement. When you talk about HVAC system, that was the discussion happened way before the pandemic about you know senior centers not having air conditions and and they happen to be cooling centers and how could the HVAC system not be working? And, and, we, we, and, and we have replaced we have replaced quite a few. We have replaced quite a few. But as time goes by, no issues, no HVAC issues do arise. Yes, and I know that, but in this year's budget, I will not accept the fact that we're in a dire budget, okay? We're getting money from the federal government and I do expect to see an increase uh, in this budget so that we can meet all these you know, critical needs that we are talking about, um, improving our senior services. So I am gonna pass back on to other council member because this, this discussion Thank is you. ongoing. And I just <laughs> hope that DIFTA has the, you know, let us know as soon as possible, the plan to reopen uh, senior centers <laughs> safely uh, so that we can let our seniors know um, when they can uh, get back to their beloved center. Uh, so I, I expect to, to hear about that um, as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. One quick follow up um, back to the tablet connection. Um, the tablet connection is going to expire next month. Did you mention anything about how, um, like, the, an extension of that at all? Or um, those who have a tablet, will they be able to get, you know, direct assistance um, on an extension so they don't have to pay? Um, that's a great question. Thank you, Council Member. So we can confirm that there is an extent, what, the extension in place. Um, and, I, and my understanding is the, the services that they receive from Oats would be continuing as well. I'm not sure if DIFTA would be able to weigh in further on that question. The actual Wi-Fi um, subscription was for one year when they received the tablets. And so um, they will be um, um, one year for the actual subscription. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry, we I can confirm that. I, I wasn't sure if my colleagues at DIFTA had that, that answer as well. We can, we can follow up and confirm that for you. Okay. Um, and some, and can you clarify some senior developments that have a senior center attached to it um, are not contracted with DIFTA. How many of those centers exist within the NYCHA portfolio? So there are um, centers that are, uh, that operate, there are North programs that are operated by, for instance, settlement houses that may have um, a funding relationship with DIFTA that's through city council allocation, for instance, but all of our formal senior centers are within contract uh, with Department of the Aging. Um, there are some smaller NORC programs that are with CBOs that have a relationship um, with DIFTA only through city council funding. Um, but all of the other standard senior centers are under DIFTA contract. Can you explain Mount Ararat to me? Excuse me? Can you explain Mount Ararat? No, I'm not familiar with that provider. Maybe I can. Yuka or O'Brien? I mean, good, good afternoon, um, council member. Thank you for that. Yes, I know you're familiar with the IRAC. So there are discretionary funding there. Um, and um, Wayside turned over the space back to NYCHA, but now they're in discussion with us to, um, for us to give them access via license agreement. So uh, my understanding is DIFTA unfunded that program about three to five years ago. And um, there were discretionary funding assigned to it. And there's a um, volunteer, Ms. Life, um, I forgot her name, but, um, that's working in the, the center. Um, but we have to negotiate with her to make sure we have um, insurance in place to support programming, ensure the seniors are protected. And Ms. Salmon from Wayside submitted a, a, a agreement a couple of weeks ago. I'm still going back and forth with her in terms of all the requirements that needs 
to be in was, place to support. Not that was getting too much in the weeds. I was just trying to figure out the structure itself because they do not have a DIFTA contract. They haven't had a DIFTA contract since pre two thousand fourteen. Right. And so, um, so that's so right now. So right now we have an elderly safer home program staff assigned to that location that um, works with Ms. Lightfoot, but I I don't have um, any uh, update as to if DIFTA will include that center in the next round of RFP. I mean, I think that's that would be one way of funding uh, or restoring funding to that program in, so in the future. For clarification, they do, they are not a NORC. They do not have, they are not right. contracted with DIFTA, right? And they right. are a senior building, a senior development because it's more than one building. And they have a large right. senior center attached to it. That's an amazing space in outdoor space. And there is no contract mm -hmm. with the city for any kind of services. And although there is an organization that used to be attached to it, they do not receive any direct funding outside of, you know, like the small $10,000 discretionary funding because it's the, that's the only way that they can actually receive funding. Um, so I just wanted to want a clarification because, you know, Sadia, you mentioned that all of a sudden, like there's something, they fall into some kind of category. And I want it to be known that like there is this particular development, not NORC, and they are not contracted with DIFTA and they have had no contract with DIFTA in a minimum of six, seven years. And so are there any other developments that fall along those same lines? So there are some and baking not, facilities, a, right? And like, like, we would have, we, it would have made it seem as though, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, right, right. Was good. Yeah, sure. that one is actually very unique and we did you know, um, for years we have <laughs> reported that Wayside is in that location, but with very minimum funding, um, like you said, the 10,000 discretionary, but for, for NYCHA, we do have the elderly safer home program there. So we don't consider it a building with no services at all, right? Okay, so, so, the st so how long has that program been in the building? It's over a year um, when we um, closed, I think it's Palmetto, it was converted to PAC, we moved that worker to Brown to support it. So for but you? A year, a year and a half or so. And that person is who? Um, Miss, Miss Gaffetti, Jean, Jeanette Gaffetti. It's Gaffetti, sorry. And she works well with Miss Light. I, I forgot her last name, it starts with Light. And she's on the ground in the building. During the pandemic, they have been working remotely, but they check in with all the seniors um, remotely um, on a daily basis. That's part of their responsibility. So they do wellness checks. They, um, they can do virtual home visit if the seniors agree and, and we have really moved towards that. Um, but yes, but we, we do support the seniors um, daily with call, wellness calls at those developments. Okay, um, so Chair Chen, I just wanted to uh, highlight that because we've made we've had conversations, um, you know, about you know, this particular development, and so what I'm hearing is that this is the out of the entire Nitro portfolio with senior buildings and senior centers, this is the only one that just so happened to be in my district. The only one, right? Well, hopefully, I think um, they we're talking about the new RFP that. Um, they could apply. And also, I think when you talk about um, 11, is it 11 North program? Um, yeah, 11 North program in, in NYCHA. Um, that's got, do you project to see more than 11? Because a lot of development have seniors aging in place. I mean, a lot of them, the, these developments are quite old and a family move in maybe in their with kids, you know, in their 30s or 40s, and now they're in their 60s and 70s. Uh, so is NYCHA and, and DIFTA looking at, uh, in terms of the development, how we can create more NORCs uh, within those developments? 
I think a lot of our okay. developments oh. will Oh, sorry, Cynthia. Oh. <laughs> no, I, well, I could just jump in. So, um, so Council Member, I uh, thank you for your question. So I just want to offer just one correction, uh, just a statement I made previously. Um, so there are 47 senior buildings um, or developments, not 49. Um, I miscounted during our call, so apologies for that. Um, and then with respect to NORC, you're correct. Most of our a significant portion of our portfolio with your definition of a NORC um, and so what really we would be seeking is funding for a work program. Um, so 11 developments have providers with funding to offer the services that you would see at a NORC. Um, we have certainly applied for funding um, and encouraged our CBO partners to apply for funding for NORC. We've not been awarded um, you know, from the state funding or other resources, um, NORC funding, but certainly we have a number of major developments that meet that criteria. Um, uh, and community-based organizations um, who continually apply for those resources as well as NYCHA. Well, I, I think we would appreciate having the list uh, of development that you think or building that you think would qualify uh, being the, a NORC because the council have provided discretionary money just to start some NORC so that they in the future could be in a, a NYCHA, I mean, in a DIFTA pipeline or get funding from the state but we need the, the statistics and the information uh, so that if you can provide us you know, with a list of developments that you think could qualify uh, to be a NORC and we can share that with our colleagues in the council and they can help us um, you know, advocate for that because we wanna make sure that the, the services are, are there for our senior because when you're talking about this elderly safe uh, program, if you can also provide us with a list of which are the senior building that have this program, um, that would be helpful uh, because I have, um, you know, a number of senior building in my district, and there are some that yeah, there is social worker and they and they do um, are able to get the help, and then others uh, do not. So we want to make sure that every senior development um, have the services that they need. So uh, if you could provide us with those information, um, I think that would be very helpful. We will, thank you. And I just have, a few, yeah. I just have a few more questions that I wanted to breeze through um, that we want to get on record. Um, does NYCHA have a trained staff on hand to address elevator outages in senior buildings? Yes, we have trained elevator mechanics and repair, for, repair people. And what options are available to seniors who are wheelchair bound or cannot take stairs when the elevators in their buildings are not functioning? Sure, so there's notification to tenants um, when there's an outage and there's updates throughout the duration. Um, I'm sure as you're aware, council member, we recently um, had a plan, uh, sorry, there's noise behind me. It's like every time <laughs> I'm going to talk a little louder, but um, we recently had um, an elevator action plan that was approved by the federal monitor um, and it includes requirements around specific outreach from our property management staff and housing assistance to vulnerable tenants. This includes making sure that they have access to stair climbers and other ways to exit um, in a, an extended outage. And so that those, that process is in place and that's part of um, the elevator outage plan that, that NYCHA um, submitted as part of its credit agreement. Okay, and going back to the vaccinations, Do you have an actual number of seniors who have been vaccinated in the NYCHA developments? So we have of the events, the vaccination events that we, excuse me, the vaccination pop-up clinics, and now we have these long-term clinics. Um, there have been at least 15,000 doses administered across, and these are city and state, as well as some of our um, other uh, hospital partners where we've had vaccination events have been over 15,000 doses administered. The majority of those are to NYCHA seniors, but as eligibility has opened, we have also started to open um, you know, eligibility to other NYCHA residents. Our direct outreach and recruitment and um, appointment registrations, however, have been focused on NYCHA seniors. Um, this, however, does not account for NYCHA residents who are accessing vaccinations within the community at pod sites, at houses of worship, at a number of the other um, vaccination uh, point, uh, distribution points that are available to the city. Um, is there a way for you to get that information? Like, um, are you doing any like surveys or uh, like self-disclosing, you know, methods 
um, to be able to get a sense of how many of your residents are actually vaccinated, you know, because the conversation around herd immunity, immunity is a is an actual thing. And um, just trying to figure out if you are looking along those lines to get a, a, a real number. Sure. So um, we don't have access to the vaccination data for good reason, but we have, um, you know, the Department of Health is tracking vaccination data at the zip code level, um, and that's updated daily and overlaps significantly with our communities. Um, we also are looking to, as the vaccination program continues, um, work to identify the number of NYCHA residents in aggregate who've been vaccinated as, the, as that data becomes available. But um, within our outreach to residents, um, as you know, as the weeks have increased and we've been reaching out to residents for appointments, we are finding that a number of residents are sharing that they've been vaccinated. At least 22% of our calls to seniors um, where we're reaching out for appointments, seniors have indicated that they've either received the first dose, they're fully vaccinated, or they have an appointment scheduled elsewhere, which is really a positive sign. But we know there's a lot of work to do um, within NYCHA and the communities surrounding NYCHA to increase uptake. How many vaccination sites are located at NYCHA at this very moment? So we've had 60 um, across the, you know, since the beginning of the vaccination program. Um, we have 11 that will be longstanding sites for um, at least four to, um, I want to say, 14 weeks. Um, and so seven of those 11 are, are, are activated now, and we have a schedule to open up the other sites. Um, and we still have some second dose appointments that are happening across the city at some of our former sites. So we can make sure that, um, uh, council member, you have an update of what's open and available right now. Um, and then the remaining sites that are scheduled to be open. And how many are seniors only? Like, so out of the seven that are activated, how many are, are senior only? So these sites are available to all eligible NYCHA residents. Our outreach is to seniors. So we are calling seniors to help schedule appointment. Test and Trace is also been on the ground, knocking on doors, and particularly reaching out to seniors. As we reach seniors who have other members in their household who are eligible, we're scheduling them for appointments as well. Um, and we've also been um, encouraging and offering seniors an opportunity for a plus one so that they can schedule an appointment with someone that they trust and want, want to attend with regardless of age, as long as that person's eligible, which now we are moving towards you know, universal eligibility. And do you believe that you have enough advance notice um, working with the administration on opening up the sites? And do you feel that you have an efficient amount of uh, workers to be able to conduct the outreach efforts? Sure, so we um, are fully working with uh, the city and the Vaccine Command Center. And we have also had members of our NYCHA team who have been assigned to the Vaccine Command Center specifically to be an integral part of this effort. So daily communication, collaborative planning, um, and really, you know, up to the minute coordination has been happening across these sites. So certainly enough advance notice. Um, and, you know, we, particularly in the early sites, a lot of our planning was really tied to um, the volume of doses that the city receives, which fluctuate, fluctuates. So there's constant adjustment within the program. Um, in terms of staff, we have, you know, certainly used, leveraged our NYCHA staff to make calls and perform outreach. Um, and we've had really great support from health and hospitals and the test and trace team, um, who have a robust network of canvassers, who've been on the ground at NYCHA developments and in NYCHA communities performing outreach. Okay, okay, okay. And um, we were talking about seniors in vulnerable um, populations as well. Um, do you differentiate between your seniors and your homebound seniors at all? So our seniors, um, we've been reaching out to seniors generally. We don't necessarily know who's medically homebound. What we do know are folks, uh, seniors who may be mobility impaired um, or who are on life-sustaining equipment, um, but that does not necessarily mean that they're, they're homebound. So as we're speaking with seniors, if they're able to come to the facility on site or nearby, um, we're scheduling appointments. I think in our calls, we've probably reached less than 10 seniors or so that have indicated that they're medically homebound and then we're able to connect them to the city's homebound program. Okay. All right, I am actually done with my questions and I know that we have also um, been joined by the Honorable um, Borough President Gail Brewer who I know is going to speak after. Um, and so, Council Audrey Sun, I'm not sure if there are any other members. 
Thanks. Um, if there are no further questions from either chair, then we will follow up with um, additional questions from Council Member Ku, and then we will move into testimony from the public, beginning with the Honorable Gail Brewer. Um, Council Member Ku, your clock will be set to three minutes. Thank and it you. starts now. Hi, uh, thank you both chairs for your advocacy for our NYCHA buildings and our seniors. You know, we always said New York City is the greatest city on earth. You know? If we don't care, if we don't take care of NYCHA buildings and our seniors, how can we say that we are the greatest city? We are the one of the worst. And so I hope the administration and, uh, and everybody involved will get involved to uh, take good care of our senior centers and our senior citizens, because they are the treasure of our community. And also the buildings, because we cannot allow the larger buildings to further deteriorating. It's, really, it's at the worst already. So we must take care of these buildings. So my question is, uh, I always receive complaint uh, since the combination of Latimer Gardens and Brand Houses uh, Management Offices. Uh, we got a complaint uh, that the office is not responsive. It's not responsive to blank residents, and that the office is never open during posted hours. I try going there during normal business hours, and the doors were locked. Uh, elderly and disabled residents cannot travel across downtown Flushing uh, to uh, Latimer House. This was even before the pandemic. So many cannot uh, uh, access the necessary technology highlighted by NYCHA. I assume this divide has only gotten worse during the pandemic as many folks did not leave their homes. So what additional support did the management office uh, provide to senior residents at planned houses uh, during the pan pandemic to ensure their concerns were addressed in a timely manner. Thank you, Council Member, for that question and for raising that concern. So um, we can, I, I don't know offhand the, the specific issues that bland and why the management office would have been locked, um, but so we can look into that and make sure it's being addressed. But with respect to um, outreach to the management office, I would also just add that while there are many digital tools that have been in place, put in place for our residents to connect with us, our customer contact center is still available by, available by phone and most of the services um, that um, a resident would access at the management office should be available remotely through the customer contact center as well. But we will make sure to look into um, the current situation at land. And then I think what you're describing in terms of the management offices is a consolidation. And um, as I'm sure you're aware, NYCHA recently released its transformation plan for the agency, which will include more decentralization of staff, of supervision, um, and also the, the opportunity to break apart some of our consolidations so that residents have a better on-site president, presence from management. So we can also follow up with you and share um, plans within your district and particularly at uh, Lattimore and Land. Okay, thank you. Please communicate with us. Yeah. Can I just- Thank you, um, Chase. Yeah. Thank you. I, I just wanted to follow up on that. I, I heard something about decentralization, uh, that there'll be more better services at each development. So can you share that plan with us? Sure, yes, council yeah. member. So we can it's certainly German. make sure, we can make sure that's available. And I think um, just high level, it's really um, making sure that the not only property management, but the functions that support property management are closer to the field and closer to our properties um, where, where our residents are being served and where decisions are made. And so that that is really the goal of that plan and we can share that with yeah, I, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing it because that has always been the, the complaint that we've heard that through the centralization, just call that central hotline and like residents are not getting uh, the services as quickly as possible. And oftentimes, you know, tickets are closed and they don't know what happened. But if they can just work with their management's office and have enough staff on site, I think that would solve a lot of the, the issues that, that we've been hearing about. So I look forward to, to seeing that plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Great, thanks very much. If there are no further questions from uh, council members, we will now move to public testimony. We will begin by hearing testimony from the Manhattan Borough President, the Honorable Gail Brewer. All right. Thank you very much um, to Chair Chin and Chair Aubrey Samuel. This is an incredibly important uh, discussion. And I think a lot of us have been to the, both the state and the city uh, NYCHA developments during the pandemic. I certainly have. God forbid they should talk to each other with all due respect. And so to have this hearing when you are talking about the entire situation, I deeply appreciate it. I don't know if my numbers are right, but between the senior only and the scatter sites and developments that are not designated as senior only, although they have a lot of seniors in them, I don't know if it's around 62,000 or more, uh, 65 or older. And again, I don't know how many are homebound, but that's a lot of people. And I, you know better than I that this God awful pandemic has brought out needs that are unique to seniors. I know when the uh, senior centers closed, and I want to thank you, Councilmember Chin, because I know you had a hearing on that and how important they are. And the most uh, example, best example, of course, was the food. And uh, we know that at that time when we had to try to get uh, seniors on the Get Food NYC list and they weren't getting on it and the food that they got wasn't the right kind of food. It was not a smooth transition. Um, people who were used to getting uh, scratch, even food at their senior center were caught in a limbo, bureaucratic limbo with you and others. We all navigated uh, the system to try to get seniors through the cracks on the list, seniors who were part of the center, seniors who were not part of the centers, I, it was a mess. And certainly without internet access, um, it was hard to sign up, period. So that one issue. Um, I do support your intro 1827 of 2019, which would establish a NYCHA liaison within the Department for the Aging. I think if that person had been there, we might have had less challenges in terms of food delivery. And because you know, this food delivery is actually going to go on. I don't think it's going to end with the pandemic. Um, I also know that looking ahead, such a person can facilitate training for NYCHA seniors uh, on the issue of technology. We all know that um, even today in 2021, 20, uh, and here we are in April, there's just an awful lot of folks who don't have their shot because they don't know how to use the internet despite all the efforts. And it is particularly true with seniors who live in NYCHA. So this kind of person could address those needs, no question, not to mention all the other lack of bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera. I'm also supportive of 415 of 2018, which requires NYCHA to annually report on senior centers that operate within NYCHA buildings. According to the Regional Plan Association in 2020, using NYC open data set, which you know is my bill, uh, NYCHA provides uh, space for 121 senior centers citywide or 47.5% of all senior centers in New York City. We all know that we need more. And we know that between November and 2021, 2020 and 2021, we reached out to all of the senior centers in the borough of Manhattan asking them about reopening because so that is the question now. And we all know that they were um, waiting for DIFTA to issue guidelines they have uh, done their best to stock up on PPE, waiting about reopening. I'd say my number one question when I go to my night and now is when will my senior center open? It is the lifeline. And we know that some centers during the pandemic, and I know that uh, the city council was helpful in pushing this because we wanted the local centers to have the ability to cook and deliver their own meals in lieu of using Get Food NYC. And I think we know what the challenges are there in terms of the quality of the food, despite all the effort, local is better. Um, and I also know that, uh, you know, just how this pandemic is gonna change how senior centers provide services to their members. Uh, reopening will not look the same. And so, it, you know, as somebody who focuses on the internet and the technology, that has got to be part of the discussion. So it's also so important to capture data from the centers, how many seniors are served, what programs are offered, the number of concerns that have been raised, how they're resolved, what's the baseline of new normal, because we don't know what that is. And if intro 415 passes, the first annual report would offer invaluable data 
with the current state of NYCHA-based senior centers and how these centers could adopt to post-COVID. Just as one example, I am trying so hard to get a garden. We can see the old raised platforms at one NYCHA senior center. Just to get the small amount of money to do that is hard. What a great opportunity for reopening, but to have fresh fruits and vegetables that are planted by the seniors with support from the senior center. Those kinds of things need to be part of the data. Do you have that fresh fruits and vegetables? How do you get them? Um, in order for seniors living in NYCHA to age in place during the current pandemic, they have to be able to reach the COVID-19 vaccine. So I have been, not to all, but an awful lot of centers that are offering uh, the vaccine. And I've seen different situations. In some cases on a weekend, I will go to seven or eight different centers. So some that are run by Javits, some that are run by obviously different hospitals, and then the ones that the state runs and the city runs vis-a-vis -vis NYCHA. And then poor Yuka, I call her, Yuka, I don't like what I'm seeing. Sorry. I don't care if it's midnight, three o'clock in the morning, Sunday, Saturday, and I want to thank Uka because she always answers my call. Thank you very much, Uka Buskip, for being such a good public servant in the city of New York. Um, and there's a lots of issues. I have to say, I'll be honest with you, and I don't want to say this, but I have to. It's just not as well organized as the other centers. And it has to be. You have the most vulnerable seniors. Um, and don't see the numbers now, in some cases, to the credit of whether it's test and trace or um, Department of Health or NYCHA. It's sometimes hard to figure out who's running it, to be honest with you, but I ask. Um, the numbers are not there. Where is the sign outside stating that this is a vaccine center? Um, where I know supposedly it's going to be going to June or May or another three weeks or whatever, but even then the first day should be full of seniors who are getting the vaccine or others underlying conditions and so on. It doesn't feel like it's got the kind of outreach that is necessary. So I'll just leave it at that. I've been to the Johnson Center. I've been to the Lower East Side. I've been to Washington Heights. I've been to almost every development um, where there is a NYCHA slash vaccine center. Um, and it does need to be more populated in terms of, and I know that in some cases, I want to give you a great example on the Lower East Side where there was a J&J &J going on, which was good. Not enough people coming in, in my opinion, but still really good. And then those who have gotten this shot earlier, which had been either Pfizer or I think it was Pfizer, they were to the credit of the nonprofit, this case, Grand Street. They were taking them in their van to Brooklyn to get the second shot because the second shot wasn't available there. So I thought, great, here's a nonprofit really doing the right thing. We still need more translation on the outreach um, in different languages, and we still need constant, constant, constant outreach in terms of getting people to show up. Um, and I, I think uh, even with the homebound, some are eligible for the J&J, &J, but they're still not getting the kind of information that they need to be able to, as a homebound person, you know, um, you have to fill out a form, there's online information, the senior centers are reaching out, but you just can't reach everybody. So yes, it's a hard job, but it has to be done with that kind of you know, this is one time life living opportunity. You're gonna save a life if you do it right. Um, so I know that a robocall is used, uh, emails, which may or may not be helpful and under the door with the leaflets. Um, but sometimes when the robocall comes, the seniors say that when they call back, there's nobody answering the phone. And you know how seniors are. If somebody doesn't answer the phone, they may not even leave a message. So uh, robocalls with a number that's not answered isn't necessarily helpful, particularly if there's a language issue. Um, print information in different languages is really the way to go. So I'm simply here to say that um, we can't age in place if we don't in a pandemic unless our city is intentionally prioritizing seniors in public housing. So um, I think I've tried to outline some of the issues, put a sign outside, um, it's true that you can't, this is an interesting problem, you can't tell the world uh, blasting it into the city's vaccine uh, site, because if you do, then with all due respect, the white people are gonna show up. From Westchester, they showed up and one night, I had to kick them out personally. So you do have to have a local strategy. And what has been working elsewhere is you give 
a tenant leader, I don't know, 20, 30 slots and say, listen, this is amount you need to fill up for this particular Saturday or Sunday. That seems to be working. And I don't, you know, or you go 10 times under the door with a leaflet, but it has to be a trusted partner that's calling that senior. Um, now, maybe the numbers are up, but I just heard 15,000. I don't know that state and city. It's hard to see if this is both because not great communication. So I want to say congratulations on the hearing. I know I've talked too much. I feel very passionately and I appreciate the opportunity to share what I've learned. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now turn to testimony from the remaining members of the public. Thanks so much for your patience. Please listen for your name as I will call individuals one by one and will periodically announce the person who is speaking next. One second, there was a question from council member. Thank you so much, really appreciate that. Um, I This is a count, uh, question for um, Borough President Brewer. I, you know, we can talk offline about this, but just because this is the topic of this hearing, you know, we uh, at Amsterdam houses have an opportunity, you know, have plans drawn for a NORC. And I think that happened while you were council member, like, you know, 10 years ago. And that never went anywhere, um, although we have beautiful plans drawn. Um, I didn't bring it up this time at the hearing. I've brought it up previously. But do you think NYCHA at all intends to go forward with those plans? It's a model. It could be a model. For oh, I mean, NYCHA knows better than I do, so I don't want it. But it's my experience that the reason NORCs make sense is that there are so many family buildings that have seniors. And so, you know, if you don't help them, they're going to get lost without that extra support. So yes, I am very, very supportive of NORCs. And um, what was found when at Amsterdam, when there was a NORC for a while, and then the funding ran out, was the mental health issues for the seniors in the family building were huge. Surprise even to social workers. So yes, I, 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 NORCs are the best way to go. Um, Definitely. And, and in this pandemic, it would have helped a lot. Thanks very much. If, uh, if there aren't any further questions, we will now turn to testimony from the remaining members of the public. Once again, please listen for your name to be called. Uh, once your name is called, a member of our staff will prompt you to unmute and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and announce that you may begin. In the interest of time, your testimony will be set to three minutes. I would now like to welcome Beth Williams to testify, followed by Brianna Payton Williams. Time starts now. Hey there, my name is Beth Williams and I'm the Deputy Director of Legal Services for Project Guardianship. We were a demonstration project of the Vera Institute of Justice before we spun off. Um, we serve as quite appointed uh, legal guardian uh, to many, many elderly people in New York City, and we've served uh, hundreds uh, in our 15 years uh, that we've been in service. Um, I personally have represented many seniors across New York City who reside in NYCHA public housing, and based on my experience, there are a couple of reasons for seniors to be displaced from their homes. Uh, one is they have a decline in their health and their ability to perform activities of daily living, and that necessitates they go to a nursing home. And the other reason is that uh, their, their tenancy is terminated and they're evicted. Um, generally, that's due to recertification issues, non-payment issues, or nuisance issues that can uh, directly be related to cognitive decline. Um, I'm really concerned that the senior centers aren't open and uh, visitation programs aren't, uh, aren't happening because of the pandemic. Um, because there's really not a, anybody watching what's happening to seniors in, in NYCHA buildings. And uh, when, when nobody's really keeping an eye on them, that means that uh, they are not going to get the medical assistance and the support that they need. 
at home. And that is what often results in them declining and ending up in a nursing facility. And uh, without a strong advocate, with a lot of time and resources, getting them home is often an impossible hurdle. Um, one issue that I've seen uh, for people that end up uh, in this situation is that it's impossible to get a reasonable accommodation from NYCHA um, because maybe a wheelchair won't fit through uh, a doorway or there's not sufficient space for a live-in aid. Um, sometimes the alternative to a reasonable accommodation is to move somebody to a different apartment, but that's sort of the antithesis of aging in place. Uh, another issue um, which uh, people have testified about is the condition and the habitability of the apartment. So when seniors are being evaluated for home care or an increase in home care hours, the apartment has to be assessed by a managed long-term care provider to determine whether it's safe and habitable before they award home care hours through Medicaid. And sadly, given the state of many of NYCHA's developments, apartments don't pass the habitability requirements of a managed long-term care provider. And of course, these requests for repairs, if they're acknowledged at all, can take months, if not years, to materialize. Um, with respect to tenancy terminations and evictions, um, we often see seniors who are suffering from cognitive decline end up unable to manage their recertifications. They have trouble managing their finances, including paying rent on time. And they can present with nuisance behaviors that are, are the result of underlying kinds of dementia. And a lot of times these people also become victims of elder abuse where unauthorized occupants may move into their home. I'm expired. Or a bad character steals funds that they would otherwise use to pay rent. Um, so be really great for NYCHA to implement policies uh, that at a minimum provide seniors with a guardian ad litem by right in any termination proceeding for, for seniors who are 60 and, and older. And I would like to say just, just before I end that while legal guardianship isn't the first line of defense in ensuring seniors age in place in their community homes. We have been very successful in maintaining our clients in the community. And I hope NYCHA administration would be open to ongoing trainings for their staff and decision makers on the use of legal guardianship and the role of a legal guardian when there are no family or friends that are able to provide support to its senior residents. Thank you so much. Uh, it looks like we have a question from Council Member Rosenthal. Um, thank you so much. Um, and, and I'm confident council members Ampri Samuel and Chin know the answer to this. So this is for my edification. Um, really appreciate that testimony, Ms. Williams. And I'm wondering, is there someone who you can speak with directly at um, NYCHA on these issues? Who's your contact? Uh, you know, um, we don't really have a person in administration who, who we've reached out to. We generally deal with uh, housing managers and housing assistants in, in the developments where our clients live. Um, but uh, generally, when we try to get through to NYCHA, we go through our contacts at HRA or APS, and they're able to help us uh, get in touch with somebody uh, who, who can move on issues of habitability and accommodation. Uh, but it would be great if, if we did have somebody that we could speak with directly. Okay, I'm seeing my liaison is on this call, this Zoom, I think. Although he may have just stepped away. But um, I don't know, it strikes me this should be number one, pretty straightforward if we had a policy about it. And number two, a person who should, who you should be able to work with. Um, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, chairs. Appreciate it. Yeah, I think we can connect you with uh, uh, the NYCHA uh, leadership. I mean, who's here today uh, with family services uh, so that you do have a, a, a direct contact. So I guess our committee council can help you connect. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Great, thanks very much. We will now hear from Brianna Payden Williams, followed by Leo Mason. Time starts now. 
Thank you. Hello, I'm Brianna Payton Williams, the Communications and Policy Associate at Live On New York. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Live On New York's members include more than 100 community based nonprofits that provide core services, which allow all New Yorkers to thrive in our community as we age. In New York City, NYCHA represents one of the greatest providers of affordable housing for low income seniors. Currently, 38% of NYCHA households are headed by an older adult age 62 and older. Just as the buildings are aging, so are the tenants that occupy them, making the need for quality and safe services in NYCHA paramount to the success of the community. Unfortunately, providers of services such as senior centers and NORCs that operate in NYCHA community spaces face daily challenges just to keep the doors open. While an emphasis must be placed on improving the living conditions of residents living in NYCHA developments, it's also important to acknowledge senior service providers have not been immune to the challenges during the pandemic. Prior to the onset of the pandemic and potentially exacerbating the pandemic's impacts, inadequate conditions in NYCHA developments, including poor ventilation systems, broken elevators, and leaking roofs are just one of the many challenges providers have worked to alleviate. While working to mitigate these repairs, providers are frequently faced with fines and violations, in addition to lengthy approval processes by and extirpate the timeline for repair. The impact of these fines and conditions are not only monetary, instead of spending critical time providing critical services for nature residents and the surrounding community, providers are forced to become experts in the nuances of repair systems outside of their job description in order to simply stay afloat. This impact cannot be understated as these nonprofit providers work tirelessly to provide high quality services to those who need it most. Now in the midst of a pandemic, it's critical that these repairs and conditions are addressed as they pose an even greater risk for residents and staff as we look ahead to resume in-person services and programming. In response to these difficulties, Live On New York recommends the city must work to continue to increase capital funding for public housing to support ventilation upgrades and other critical infrastructure improvements, redirect fines to ensure nonprofits are not penalized for violations that are out of their control control and fully fund the indirect cost rate initiative, which is critical to ensuring nonprofits operating in NYCHA remain viable in the future. In addition, Live On New York strongly supports intro number 1827 that would provide a dedicated NYCHA liaison within DIFTA. To ensure there is a clear and consistent line of coordination, there should be an individual within DIFTA whose sole focus is to coordinate with NYCHA on matters impacting older adults. We also support intro number 1415, uh, 415, excuse me, that would require NYCHA to report annually on senior centers within NYCHA buildings. As we look to create better solutions solutions for older adults who rely on senior centers for critical services, receiving an annual report from NYCHA would provide senior services and community-based organizations with the necessary information to create evidence-based solutions. And I'll just close on, as we look ahead to warmer seasons when senior centers located in NYCHA will act as cooling centers for those in need, NYCHA developments and DIFTA fiscal must work to accelerate the approval process for repairs and replacements uh, for poor HVAC systems. Further, as DIFTA moves towards reopening of in-person senior services, funding and flexibility for, pro for budget amendments must be prioritized to ensure senior centers in NYCHA can proactively address leaks and other issues. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. I would now like to welcome Leo Azen to testify, followed by Molly Krakowski. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairs Chin and Amprey Samuel, and members of the City Council Committee on Aging and Public Housing. <laughs> My name is Leo Azen, and I am the president of AARP New York, representing 750,000 members of the 50 plus community in New York City. NYCHA plays a significant role in providing affordable housing and critical services for a large portion of New York's older population. 21% of NYCHA residents were 62 years or older. However, the health and well being of NYCHA tenants have suffered as a result of the consequences stemming from years of disinvestment. As a result of this neglect, NYCHA residents have too long 
gone without heat and hot water in winter months, faced adverse health conditions stemming from poor indoor air quality, and even been trapped in their apartments when elevators are out of service. These issues have only been compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic as residents have been left more vulnerable to contracting COVID-19 due to old and outdated air ventilation systems, as well as elevators that are routinely out of service and often cause crowding. The city, state, and federal government need to act immediately with strong policies and funding in order to address these issues. AARP fully supports City Council Intro 1827, which would create a NYCHA liaison within the Department for the Aging. AARP also supports Intro 415 in order to develop mechanisms that would help city leaders better understand the scope and services offered at NYCHA Senior Centers. NYCHA Senior Centers are a critical component of the city's infrastructure and will be critical to addressing the needs of older NYCHA tenants that have been exacerbated by the pandemic, especially regarding food insecurity, social isolation, healthcare, and other related social services. We also believe that the city should expand funding allocated to NYCHA senior centers in order to support their efforts amid the city's recovery from the pandemic. AARP also calls on the city, state, and federal government to set aside funding that would address NYCHA's 31 billion worth of capital infrastructure needs, especially regarding elevator maintenance and air filtration projects in order to protect the health and well-being of NYCHA's aging residents. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. I would now like to welcome I would now like to welcome Molly Krakowski to testify, followed by Suhali Men Mendez. Time begins now. Hi, good morning, afternoon. Um, my name is Molly Krakowski. I'm the Senior Director of Government Affairs at JASA. Um, I'd like to thank Chair Embry Samuel and um, Chair Chin and members of the committees for hosting today's important hearing. Uh, JASA has served New York um, uh, as one of the largest organizations and trusted agencies serving older New Yorkers for the last 50 years um, in Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Queens. Um, we are very appreciative of the New York City Council's continued focus on the needs of the most vulnerable New Yorkers throughout the pandemic. And the spotlight on this population and older New Yorkers must continue as the budget negotiations for FY22 move forward. JASA has a longstanding partnership and productive partnership, approximately 40 years with NYCHA. We have five DIFTA contracted senior centers located in NYCHA sites, Throg Snack and the Randall Balcom Houses, Sue Ginsburg and Pelham Parkway Houses, Bay Eden at the Baychester Houses and Williamsburg and the Williamsburg Houses and Cooper Park, which is in the Cooper Park Houses. In addition, JASA provides NORC, prevent, uh, NORC supportive service programs in Bushwick Highland and Surfside O'Dara Gardens developments. Um, two communities are now part of the PACT program, um, Bay Eden, which is in the Baychester, Murphy and Williamsburg. Um, many NYCHA residents are also assisted by JASA case management, our elder abuse programs, and a variety of other um, DIFTA funded programs. Um, NYCHA has proven a strong and supportive pro um, uh, partner to JASA and our NORC programs and our senior centers, participating in community events and providing support to help JASA secure additional funding, including um, very um, competitive funding from New York State Office for the Aging and the last RFP project um, uh, for the NORC programs. Um, I want to just skip ahead. Unfortunately, um, NYCHA's demonstrated commitment to helping its senior residents age in place is seriously challenged by the aging facilities infrastructure and limited maintenance capacity. And this negatively impacts program operations as well as the experience of individual tenants. Typically, issues include broken doors, flooding caused by rain and leaks, out of service elevators, uneven sidewalks. Building security and lightning needs are other concerns, and there are often long wait times uh, for service tickets response and multiple tickets needing to be submitted. So we welcome intro 1827, uh, which would see the creation of the much needed liaison between NYCHA and facilities um, and matters impacting older adults. 
Um, skipping to um, COVID-19 response, um, JASA has obviously been making thousands of phone calls within NYCHA um, and to older New Yorkers, um, in addition to just checking in, doing wellness calls and supporting um, uh, connectivity to resources in the community. We've also been working to assist with vaccination appointments. Um, we applaud the um, city's um, outreach and um, providing the uh, technology, the oats um, and the tablets. Um, that being said, we would like to see if this moves forward, a connection between tablet distribution and service providers in NYCHA. Um, it would have been, and it could be very um, beneficial to have connectivity between um, senior service providers who are already existent in the community and those who are receiving the tablets tablets to um, build on their um, benefit to the community. Um, and finally, JAS is working closely with the city um, to outreach, um, like I said, to, um, to set up vaccinations, but also we're serving um, in partnership with NYCHA um, as pop-up clinics um, in a number of our sites, as well as our Bay Eden Senior Center, which is going to be a longer term clinic. Um, for um, for COVID vaccinations. Um, we're also identifying homebound NYCHA residents who are in need of vaccinations in the sites that we serve um, as part of the latest vaccination campaign for the homebound. Um, we look forward to continuing our collaboration with New York City Housing Authority, DIFTA, and the New York City Council. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I would now like to welcome Suhali Mendez to testify, followed by Melissa Sklarz. Time begins now. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Suhali Mendez, and I'm a senior advocate and New York Lawyer for the Public Interest Disability Justice Program. Um, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest is a civil rights organization with a robust disability rights practice, which um, also has a housing advocacy for people with disabilities. And this is a very important part of our work. Um, we represent tenants in matters, including the need for reasonable accommodations, such as apartment and common area retrofitting, transfers to accessible apartments, protect and protection of the use of service animals, as well as other housing discrimination issues, such as source of um, income discrimination. We appreciate the opportunity um, to provide testimony regarding the, this matter, and um, I we want to commend the work of the introduction to Bill 415, um, sponsored by Council Member Chin, and the introduction of the Bill 1827, um, sponsored by Council Member Amprey um, Samuel. It is important that the New York City Housing Authority creates accessible resources and spaces for its senior citizen re residents and people with disabilities. In order to meet the needs of seniors that live in, in NYCHA developments, as well as all New Yorkers with disabilities, NYCHA must take immediate action to increase the number of accessible apartments within NYCHA's portfolio, making reasonable accommodations and modifications for existing NYCHA tenants, as well as vastly decreasing the amount of time that tenants with disabilities must wait in order to obtain accessible housing and or reasonable accommodations within their units. NYCHA must increase its accessible housing stock in order to meet the needs of NYCHA tenants who are senior citizens and or have disabilities. In order to facilitate some of the needs of tenants who are senior citizens and or people with disabilities, it is imperative to have the appropriate resources available and have accountability on the effectiveness of these resources. Over the years, we have received calls from people with disabilities who occupy not just housing spaces and waited months, even years for reasonable accommodations or even to be transferred to an accessible apartment. We hear frequently from NYCHA tenants that, to report, that they report the elevators are in woeful disrepair and continuously breaking down, leaving them trapped and isolated from their communities. Accessible features such as elevators must be maintained in working order so that they can be readily used for all individuals within NYCHA. As documented in the New York City um, Accessible NYC report, approximately 11% of New Yorkers, over 1 million people, 
disclose living with disabilities. Furthermore, as noted in the mayor's housing report, I'm expired. Point, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, residents who are at least 65 years old are projected to increase 40% between the years 2010 and 2040. So nearly 40% of NYCHA households are headed by residents who are 62 years or older. New York City has reportedly promised to build more senior housing on existing NYCHA land within with, which, excuse me, which thus far has been wholly insufficient to address the crisis of people with disabilities who live in these residences. And in order to meet the needs of these tenants, NYCHA and New York City must make further act, immediate action to address the needs of senior citizens and tenants with disability. We implore that the city council, as well as, as the mayor's office, to take steps to match the supply of accessible NYCHA housing for the needs of public housing population. Thank you so much for your time. And I hope um, that um, this information was well received. Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to welcome Melissa Sklarz to testify, followed by Bonnie Lumagui. Hi. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Melissa Sklarz. I'm the Senior Government Relations uh, Strategist at SAGE. Uh, SAGE was founded in 1978. It's the oldest and largest organization dedicated to improving the lives of LGBT older people in New York. I want to thank uh, uh, Chairs Amprey Samuel and Chairs Chen. Always great to be with friends. Um, housing is a basic need in New York and New York City housing needs are critical. Data shows that there are 3.2 million uh, people in New York State over the age of 65 and 1.1 million over the age of 65 in New York City. The estimates would be 200,000 LGBT elders in New York State and 100,000 LGBT elders over 65 in New York City. As of today, there are 230 units of LGBT welcome affordable housing in New York City, and that is our SAGE housing. Um, in 2019, we opened Stonewall House in Fort Greene with 145 affordable units of LGBT friendly affordable housing. This year, we are opening the Cortona Pride House in each three month with 83 units, people are moving in as we speak. Of course, our uh, schedule was delayed by a year of COVID. Um, in Stonewall House, 25% were set aside for formerly homeless. And in Cretona, 30% was set aside for formerly homeless. Both buildings are anchored by SAGE centers, state-of-the-art centers uh, that, will have, that will be beacons for not only residents that live in these buildings, but for elders throughout the community and the neighborhood. Uh, they will uh, provide services and programming for, for, for everything that elders will need to navigate being in New York. So the irony right now, we have the, um, the Stonewall generation, the people that gave us the Stonewall riots are at risk for stigma, discrimination, uh, lack of security and health needs. Um, what we've shown is that case management and support services diminish health care and costs and reductions in ambulatory care. SAGE and the New York City Council can show the way nationwide for LGBT friendly affordable housing and services. Uh, with COVID, we've transitioned to our programming to online. We have over 100 programs uh, and uh, we've also created SAGE Connect, which allows volunteers to help and reach out to our constituency where isolation is the biggest need because of their thin support networks. SAGE requests more access to technology. SAGE supports both persons of purchase of technology, better broadband and Wi-Fi access in public housing. Uh, we hope that older adult centers must be included in this plan. We are always grateful to our relationship with our friends in the city council. Time expired. Uh, we, we need more housing, more access to technology, programs, and services. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. I would now like to welcome Bonnie Lumagui to testify. Time begins. Thank you. 
Um, good, uh, good afternoon. Um, and I want to thank uh, Council Member Margaret Chin and Council Member um, Amphrey Samuels for today's um, hearing. It's extremely a timely topic of senior centers in public housing. Hamilton Madison House has long been deeply dedicated to supporting seniors in Manhattan, especially in the neighborhoods of the Lower East Side and Chinatown. In particular, we extend services to low income and immigrant seniors, many of Asian descent residing in NYCHA. Most relevant to this hearing is the Smith Nork located in the Smith houses in the NYCHA on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Perhaps more than any other population as we've discussed throughout this hearing today, how devastating the effects of COVID-19 have been on the senior population, especially those residing in NYCHA. As is well known, large majority of, of seniors sadly died due to COVID-19 um, and has compelled many seniors to remain at home to avoid contact with others and creating isolation, mental health difficulties and other struggles. Uh, closing of senior centers in particular has created serious challenges in that these programs serve as the hubs and safety nets for so many seniors for, uh, for mu with mul meeting multiple essential purposes, meals, translation services, access to so many other vital programs. To compensate for the loss of senior centers, Hamilton Madison House has preserved alternative methods for supporting our seniors. And we thank Trinity Church and Common Pantry for providing pantry to our seniors because the food, many of our seniors felt that they were receiving from the Get Food program was just not adequate for their needs. We are also delivering meals made available from organizations like Rethink that provide culturally competent meals to our members. We look forward to the day when we can reopen the Smith Center and we intend to work with DIFTA and others to ensure the reopening occurs in a, max, in a manner that maximizes safety for seniors and allows for the most satisfying possible experience. The other thing that we really need to talk about is the support for immigrants, ensuring that all seniors serving in, immigrant populations are fully equipped to respond to the unique post COVID-19 needs of the population with respects to matters of nutrition, health, culture, and language needs. To, and also to support seniors who feel anti-Asian and other anti-immigrant sentiment makes them unsafe to travel independently. Um, our recommendations for, uh, to DIFTA for comprehensive safety measures. Issue safety and screening protocols and procedures and extend the resources necessary to comply, including staffing to manage screening temp and temperature checks. Extend resources to allow for proper ventilation, adequate cleaning and crowd control. Um, recommendations, there are other recommendations that I had that are in the testimony that I submitted as well. Recommendations regarding meal provision. Uh, grab and go can be done and it was done effectively in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and we, we would need to be sure that there are efforts to ensure social distancing um, and establish criteria for meal recipients who may accept meals on behalf of seniors. Um, I also wanna point out that the upcoming NORC and Senior Center RFPs, we strongly, um, we strongly urge the delay of the RFPs until senior centers reopen to full capacity. To complete a proposal for a multi-year contract requires time and attention that is not presently available as organizations are focused on meeting the increased needs that the pandemic has created. We also find it impossible to plan and develop programming in our current situation with COVID, and we do not have a clear timeline for reopening. If a new RFP is issued, we recommend that a new concept paper that reflects the latest circumstances and afford direct service organizations the opportunity to comment and thereby share perspectives about the ways in which the environment has been altered by the pandemic and how accordingly programs should be shaped for the future. Thank you again. Um, Hamilton House will be pleased to partner with the City Council and DIFTA to ensure a safe and productive reopening to senior centers in NYCHA. Thank you. This concludes the public testimony. If we have inadvertently call, forgotten to call on someone to testify, Please use the Zoom raise hand function now and we will try to hear from you at this time. Seeing no hands, I will turn, now turn it back over to Chairs Amprey Samuel and Chin to close the hearing. Thank you so much. I first want to um, recognize um, all of the suggestions that were made during the public testimony. Um, it's been very helpful 
and some great suggestions um, that should be incorporated. I didn't even touch that. <laughs> um, the suggestions that have been made are greatly appreciated um, and we should be utilizing that information um, in our conversations with the administration. Um, I'll end with this. We should be proactive. We should be proactive and not reactive. Instead of waiting to be told what to do and waiting to be told about next steps. We should be working together and dictating policy and procedures and how we are working with our seniors. And I hope that this hearing um, spoke directly to the issues and how we can actually work better together on behalf of our seniors. So I wanna personally thank um, Chair Chen for your partnership and your ongoing advocacy on behalf of our Asian um, New Yorkers. So thank you. Um, thank you to NYCHA for your testimony, um, to the advocates and to DIFTA. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Chair Chen. Yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to thank you, uh, Chair April Samuels for co-chairing this important meeting and for your strong advocacy for our residents in NYCHA. Um, it is so critical um, that we have these hearings and then we hear what's going on uh, in NYCHA and in DIFTA and then also hear from the suggestions from our advocates. And what the takeaway is that you hear from the provider, they're ready. They're ready to reopen safely. Um, all they need is the, the go ahead and also the, the resources to make sure that there is resources for the deep cleaning and, and uh, everything that needs to be in place. And that's why we are demanding uh, from the administration, a plan has to be in place and we have to get our center uh, open back up and address you know, the needs of our senior and our growing senior population. And we know that from the pandemic, there are a lot of seniors who were never connected to senior center, actually found out about our senior centers because they was the one that were helping them uh, with the Get Food program and helping them with other needs that they have. So I just wanted to really thank all the advocate who, who came with your suggestion, I hope our president and uh, all the staff and, and sergeant who helped make the hearing successful. And we will continue to follow up with you because right now it's the budget process. And we have to make sure these critical programs are funded um, by the administration. And as I said earlier, this time there is no excuse for no money because there are money coming down from the federal government and hopefully also from the state government. So we have a more uh, robust budget this year and we gotta make sure that critical programs and repairs are being funded and our NYCHA developments are being taken care of. So thank you again for everyone for uh, coming today. And um, I'll turn it back to you, Chair April Samuel, to close up. Thank you. And that will conclude our oversight hearing with the Chair on Public, with the Committee on Public Housing and the Committee on Aging, titled Seniors Aging in Place in NYCHA during a Pandemic. Um, thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>